Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Ann Arbor's World Information Architecture Day for 2022. I thank you all for coming here today. Um, I'm excited to hear from our three different speakers. Um, before we do that, though, I want to go ahead and go through our local organizers. And so we have Jeff Michael here today, and he's our Wired Chair, um, who's helped with event planning, along with we have Christine. Uh, we have me as a presenter, Elizabeth, and we do have Gwen. Um, so thank you all to our local volunteers and organizers for you know setting up for today's event. And before we get started, I just want to highlight to everyone that um, we are committed to making sure this is a very safe place. And so the board of directors of the World Information Architecture Association uh, drafted a code um, so that we you know we respect everyone and there's no form of harassment towards the speakers, the participants, or any of the volunteers today. And so um, there's going to be a, there's a link right here. It's going to be dropped in the chat about the code of conduct for today. And I just ask that everyone. Um, that everyone please respect each other, mute when you can. I do have the settings on so everyone is muted when they come in. Um, so when you do unmute, please be intentional and remind yourselves to unmute um, or to mute yourself again once you're done with your questions. So again, welcome to World IA Day 2022 and here in Ann Arbor. Um, it's with 32 locations, 17 countries and five continents. And today's agenda, so about 9 to 9.30, we might even start earlier so we have time for questions. Um, is that we're doing some introductions, some welcoming our community, um, have some announcements and future events. Then we're gonna go into the 9.30 time slot, which is our guest speaker, Daniel O'Neill from the Understanding Group. And he's gonna give a presentation on a million go uh, gorgeous messes, our broken digital ecosystem, how to fix it. And then he's gonna have a question session right after, and then we will have a 10 minute break. Um, a 10 to 15 minute break. And then at 10.30, we will have uh, Shannon, who's a student, um, going to share, do the shared visions, values of virtual designing systems. Um, and she's a student here at the School of Information. And then we do have another 10, 10 to 15 minute break. And then at 11, around 11.15, 11, maybe even earlier, um, we do have Darren Hood here today with us for his uh, presentation on long live information architecture, the connected world uh, version. And then after that, if we end early, then we're going to go ahead and go into just a very free for all open network session. It's going to be very fluid. So you can ask extra questions. Um, if I remember correctly, Daniel is going to be has to leave right after um, his presentation. So if you have any questions for him afterwards, please message him on LinkedIn or you can drop his email in the chat. Um, and then I believe Shannon, uh, Shannon and Darren will be with us during this open networking session. Um, so if you have any questions with him or want to, you know, meet with them, them, you're able to do. And then we can, we do have breakup rooms. And so if you guys want to meet just as professionals, we stay in the meeting room, we can definitely do that. Um, we're going to be, we're just like the pandemic, we're going to be very responsive. As a reminder, so World IA Day um, happened in one day, essentially, and it was 30 locations, 17 countries, and five continents. Um, but we pushed ours a week later just because spring break was happening, and so we wanted to have as many people come as they could. Um, and so we just want to thank everyone for being here today. And so as a reminder, um, so World of Fashion Day is a one-day year event where the community comes together as a global conference. And it's created by organizers like us. So a uh, majority of the people on our uh, local uh, organizers are students. Uh, we're master students. And so we host these and we encourage some conversations about information architecture. And just some history for people who are new is that um, it was first established back in 2012 as a one day event, with just like a few dozen locations. Um, and then from there, we have grown as it is today. And that link will also be posted in the chat. Again, like uh, last week, uh, it was a connected, our theme was a connected world and was hosted on March 5th, 2022. And it was also a virtual event. Um, so right after the whole pandemic, it kind of brought up question is like in a world where we're so connected, we feel so distant. So how do you facilitate, facilitate connectedness through all of this? Um, so that was our theme for this year. And then I just would like to thank our global sponsors because there is going to be a raffle and we're going to have a QR code at the end. And if you have to leave during these events, it will be recorded and probably posted onto YouTube or, or Vimeo. And then you are also, uh, after the event, going to be receiving an email from us with the slide deck as well as the QR code for today's raffle. That is brought to you by our sponsors today, Optimal Workshop and Pool Party, S3, Rosenfield, Rosenfeld, and then um, some of our other community partners and volunteer partners. And just because we like social media, just so you know, we do have some official hashtags. So we have YAD, YAD 2022, Connected World, and at World IA Day. 
And some events that we are hosting is um, that's upcoming is the 24 hours of UX. Um, it's a group of individuals. Um, they're all about UX, UI design, and they are all hosting another uh, global event on June 8th. Um, and it's gonna stretch between seven, eight and nine of June. And then they're also asking for uh, a call for community members to come join them and help out with their speakers. And then uh, they do have a podcast called 24 Minutes of UX. So if you guys are interested in, in like getting more familiar about UX, um, that's one of our uh, links that we we're suggesting. Uh, for students and some alumni here in the Ann Arbor area um, is that we do have some events going on called Reversing the She Session, a moderated conversation of empowering women and getting back to work. Um, so we have an event going on on 317. And again, you'll get these slides and so you can click on that link on the left right here and you can go ahead and sign up. We also have one from the Engaged Learning Office here at University of Michigan for students for um, it's a better poster with Mike Morrison event. And you can register right here. And it's all about the principles of user experience design um, and how to share your work in a very efficient way. Um, and so the presenter is Mike Morrison. He's part of the former user experience designer. Um, and he's pursuing a PhD in work psychology. All right, I know that's kind of early. I'm gonna give everyone just about a minute and then we can start going into our speaker, Daniel, and we can start a little early and then we can have some questions for you. All right, so we'll just give one minute and I think we can go ahead and start. Um, oh, awesome, thank you, Keith. That's a really fun fact to hear. All right, um, I think I just need to give you some host powers, Daniel, and I think you'll be all set. Okay. Do you want me right. to, should I be able to share my screen now? Yep. Okay, let's do that. Let me just get it turned on here. No problem. Uh, all right, let's see. Can you guys see that? Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks for having me today. I um, I gave one of these a couple of years ago before the plague, and uh, it was really one of my my favorite events. You know, it, it's a little weird giving talks about IA the World IA Day, just because um, sometimes you feel like you're giving a pep talk. You know, most of the things that you're talking about are things that a lot of people already understand. You're trying to reframe things a little bit so people can think about it different ways. So I don't, I don't expect anybody here to be surprised by anything I say. In fact, I was just, I was saying, I was just looking at the keynote, and um, one of the key terms that were in there was was the word context, which I'm going to use a lot. Uh, but you know, hopefully this will give us a, a, a different frame for thinking about some things, and always, you know, give give some juice so that we can have these conversations within our organizations and to help people understand what's so special about information architecture. Um, the title of the thing is Million Gorgeous Messes, Our Broken Digital Ecosystem and How to Fix It. I want to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, just broadly speaking. Uh, I'm a trained scientist and a business analyst. And as you, as you probably saw from the slide of my background, you know, I've had a lot of experience in, in, in metrics and technology. I've, I've had, uh, I've actually had, have had role, I did scientific research. I was actually a PhD candidate um, before I realized that it wasn't for me and I dropped out. I was studying, um, I was studying social behavior of savanna baboons and uh, I was interested in the evolution of language. Um, and I've had roles in software development up and down the technology stack, all the way from initial database design, all the way up through system architecture and then, and then high level business analysis. You know, but at my core, I've always been a, a unicorn hunter, right? I, I am searching for, the, for how to understand how things work in order to make the world better. And, you know, I, I've developed, I've done this in a pre, some pretty interesting context, right? I've developed software requirements for products and finance and marketing e-commerce and gaming, you know, I've, I've actually provided business analysis and strategy for some of the largest companies in the world. But, you know, nothing compares to what I've experienced at the Understanding Group. Um, I just had my mind completely blown when I got there because I met, you know, basically, in my opinion, the folks who had figured out how to catch the unicorns with information architecture, which I'd never heard of before. 
I was, in, I was introduced to the vast mysteries of making things be good. Just to kind of give you a quick background about what Tug is as a company, um, they evaluate, architect, and design complex digital places that are good for people. Now, this is our current crew. I think we actually have one more person who just came on last week, uh, Travis LaFour. And they're just a really neat, smart bunch of people. Um, Tug doesn't write code or design pixels. We help clients make better, better decisions and incur less risk by understanding the interplay between what they mean, what they say, and what people do. And the end result is, 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 is a coherent and consistent way to structure words, concepts, and experiences where things are findable and people are easily and intuitively, people easily and intuitively do what they want and need to do. And I want to give a personal anecdote about this. By the time I got to Tug, I'd spent 20 years trying to make good software and it hadn't gone great, right? And one of the things that was really interesting about working at Tug was that I kept seeing them succeed beyond my wildest expectations on all these projects. And I had no idea why. And I was, I, there was, there's something going on with information architecture that changes the way people understand how to make things. Um, and so I really, I really bought into it. And I spent a lot of time thinking about it. There's another talk I gave a couple of years ago about kind of how the, the nature of architecture changes is a different way of thinking. But the key thing about it was that when you solve problems in terms of architecture, you, you really do change the ability to, to, for companies to successfully deploy software. Um, but, you know, frankly, it, it, it's not a, a widespread discipline. And right now, I think we really need it. Um, this talk is a, is a reflection on some of the things I've been watching with, it, with frankly increasing distress about our digital tools, right? I mean, plainly put, our digital world's a mess and it's not getting any better. And it's very weird to me because we live in this increasingly connected world, but there's enormous friction and confusion in the way that, in, that, in that world. Digital is harder to use, it's less consistent. It's a poor overall user experience despite the massive improvements in hardware networking and software coding quality. The, the quality of software is much better than it's ever been. But the products are not good. They're not well made. And I don't know how to solve all of this, but I wanted to lay out the basic trends I'm seeing, talk about some of the big challenges, and then suggest a small way forward. Um, I'm going to start with some anecdotes and then a framework for the way this pain is manifesting in our uh, online behavior. I'm going to talk about our knackful world, which is, which is really kind of the, the main theory of this. And then I'll talk about some ways to, to think about uh, IA um, so that you can really help people uh, deal with some of this confusion. So I'm going to start with a, with an, I'm going to, it's kind of an easy target, but I'm going to start with Microsoft. Uh, I'm effectively the IT admin for Tug, which means that I spend a lot of time dealing with software as a service interfaces. And we recently tried to expand our capabilities uh, with Microsoft. So we purchased some small business licenses to do things like run MS Word and integrate our MS Teams accounts with other clients. But, you know, Microsoft doesn't usually tell you how to administer these systems, not explicitly, um, but that's unusual in, in SaaS systems. What, what is unusual is I couldn't figure out how to actually do it. And I spent six hours, which is a very long time working with these systems, just trying to figure out which URL to use, which address of which system to get to the right interface for my purposes. And then uh, I, I, had, I had to work tremendously hard to figure out how to configure our online presence so Microsoft could accept us as a company that he could even use their tools. And the biggest problem was not technical. Uh, everything they were asking me to do was things I knew how to do. But the, the biggest problem was there were literally four different control panels I could log on to that had some term business or command center within the Microsoft constellation of services. But only one of them allowed me to purchase licenses and manage our company's account. And when I finally figured it out, mostly just by clicking around, um, you know, going to Google to see which one they thought it was, uh, I bookmarked the URL and I never didn't look anywhere else again. I do not understand the way our system works. And here's the key thing. To this day, I could not explain to you the difference in these systems. Uh, and for as an old coder, that's a very weird feeling, right? Microsoft is a serious case of this. It's all over their systems. They are not connected. It's bewildering to use uh, Teams. You're always worried if you put a file in a place, you're never going to find it again. Um, they are, they are their, all, their entire ecosystem is kind of disconnected. Right? But, you know, you can say, well, that's Microsoft. It's an enterprise tool. They have a small captive audience. You have to put up with it. 
Well, what if I want to manage my storage issues on my handheld consumer smartphone, specifically my iPhone, right? Uh, we had to do this recently in order to reinstall an operating system on my wife's phone, but I have to do it just for my iPhone storage in general. I mean, after all, the apps take up space and so does app data. So I'm going to go into a little bit of detail here because it's really informative of the place we're in. And, and I also want to do it because it's important to surface this. People love Apple products. They really love them. So they don't always realize that some, how bad some of these IA decisions are, you know? Um, I'm going to start by saying, you know, when we st when I started diving into this problem solving effort, the fix, you know, finding a fix, not implementing, but finding it was pretty easy, right? If you ask Google, how do I clear my storage? You get dozens of people who are helpfully telling you how to do this. All I have to say is a computer program from way back that, you know, used to have to do this by carefully and closely reading technical manuals to get a deep understanding of systems and addressing certain kinds of bugs. I'm infinitely grateful for Google and the way it allows us to find these tricks, but they are tricks. And they tell us more about the problem and how we got here. So if I take some of these, what I did is I actually, um, you know, here, this is actually a typical description of how to solve storage problems with the iOS that I adapted from a couple of how-tos I found on the internet. So because of an IA, I decided to color code some of the concepts that are in these instructions, just to show how the various elements are involved. Bold is an app. It doesn't show very well in this font, but bold is an app. Blue is a non-interactive title on the page. Pink is a command in the screen. Green here at the bottom, can barely see it, but like app size and documents and data, those are supposed to be green. Uh, and those are, those are um, actually, those represent data values. So you can see the size of, a, of, a, of, of what you're, what's being stored. So I can at least five different screens, two apps and several different command types. Okay, I, I, don't want, I want to concede, this might be an edge case. Okay, I'm an old dude. I have strong opinions about how things should work. Uh, I'm obsessed with using older equipment that is not necessarily in the sweet spot of what Apple is selling, but I, I did really try very hard. Maybe you can talk to me afterwards to find something that would resonate with other people. Smartphone hard drives are pretty small and we love our apps. And so this probably comes up for a lot of people. And even if it is a little edge casey, this is, this is just not cool, right? And this isn't insanely great. What's the coherent narrative running through the iOS about what data is, storage, file management, application identity, anything? The language is different from app to app, from screen to screen. And it's their operating system. The whole thing is their operating system. They don't have to do it this way, right? Um, so, you know, even, even usually on Google, there are screenshots to support these instructions, but even then, there is no obvious concept here. There's no understanding. It's not to say that there aren't rules here. There have to be or the phone wouldn't work in the sense that you wouldn't be able to write code for it. Um, but the rules aren't for us. And maybe they're not even for the different development teams putting this, these, this product together. So both these software companies basically supporting what I would say are their core platforms. And you could make the argument that these are the two greatest software companies in the world with the greatest potential control they have over their environments are making products that can not only, that, that can only be used if you have local, specific non-transparent procedural skills. That's not great. That's badly made. And by badly made, I don't mean the code is bad. Code's probably magnificent. I'd probably cry if I looked at it. But it's not, these are not coding tools. These are information tools. And when you talk about bad information, then that, that then these systems are badly made. So I kind of had to figure out a way of thinking about what was going on here. And I actually found something really interesting. Historically, if you could figure out how to make a, how to, how to, how to use a badly made thing, it meant you had a knack for things. And most, and we are starting to live in a world where you have to have a knack for doing most of the stuff we interact with dozens of times a day. So a knack, the way that I, I'm trying to define it, right, is a set of specific tricks for dealing with a specific localized problem. In a complex world made with badly made stuff, they become increasingly important because the thing doesn't have the affordance that allows you to work with it without knowing a secret way to solve the problem. And in pre-industrial and early industrial periods, a lot of stuff was badly made. So people had to learn how to exactly jiggle a doorknob to get it open, you know, or like if you had to start a car, you know, you had to like turn the key just right. So knacks were, were, were a critical part of just navigating the built world uh, because they were manufacturing stuff in a way that they didn't really understand how to do it in a, uh, in a standardized way. But it even happens now. This is a picture of my 
uh, sinks uh, spray hose. We bought this replacement product about you know about a year ago, and I love it. But um, about a month ago, it something happened to it. I don't know what happened, but basically, if you squeeze it all the way and push the button down, it's the button doesn't come back up, right? So the first time I discovered this is when I put the sprayer and in, back into the slot and it sprayed me in the face which was fun. And so what I figured out initially was that you could, and this is a picture of me, unless it's still loading, you can hold it like this and the button's all the way down, see that? Now, if I run hot water through this in about 15 seconds, the button comes back up, but I don't wait 15 seconds and wait hot water to do it, right? So what I figured out, I'm the only person in the universe that knows how to solve this problem. What I figured out is if you squeeze this button just right, it'll come back up again. So I have a knack for my sprayer. My wife does it. My wife doesn't even know this is a problem, right? My kids won't do it. I'm the only person in the universe knows to do it. I could show you how to do it, but you probably have to figure it out yourself. That's a knack. Think about all the knacks you have, the ways that you have locally solved a problem on some of your interfaces that maybe you haven't told anybody else about. They're everywhere, right? So why are things less well-made in the digital ecosystem? Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. I jumped ahead. Um, so this, and I'm not, this isn't just my hose, my, my, my spray hose or my sink, right? We definitely live in a knackful world. One of the things I love looking at is word frequency in Google, right? And since 1980, there's been a massive increase in the use of the word knack in popular and written pro, uh, uh, books, in newspapers, and even in the dialogue people have online. Um, a lot of that is a conflation of knack and skill in the information economy. I mean, we live in a complicated world, so we can talk about a knack to do things from an informational perspective. But um, the essential quality of what a knack is is true, regardless of whether or not you're talking about a knack for picking so stocks or a knack for fixing computers. So it, it's, it's not that surprising if you think about it, right? I mean, simply put, we're, we're, we've got massive numbers of new products. But in my opinion, the biggest issue is not the proliferation of products. Um, it's that our ability to make things as far as outstripped our ability to architect or design them. Uh, there was a guy back in the, in, in the early odds, a guy named Zay Frank, who uh, talked about how weird it was that everybody knew what a font was. And his dream, I think his dream was that we would basically all become ninja designers, right? But what we ended up becoming was ninja tool makers. We, end up, we all ended up becoming people who know how to make stuff without thinking about it intentionally. You know, and so as a result of that, you know, a million different ideas have proliferated, somewhat similar in plan and intent, but they're different enough that each discrepancy creates a snowballing mass of friction and confusion. And as I pointed out above, this, this even happens on development teams within the same companies working on the same application or platform. And there's so many of these. And many of them require me to learn some weird procedural thing that allows me to operate it because it's badly made. Um, and remember, if a product is made of information, and that information is bad, is hard to understand, that product is badly made. This is really key because when you have an argument with developers about code quality or acceptance criteria or any of those other things, they'll say, hey, we hit all the targets, right? Story's been told, hit all the acceptance criteria, but it sucks. And the reason is they're using the wrong rules for understanding what good is. Um, well, honestly, why does it matter? I mean, we have Google to send us all the knacks we want, right? We get a million apps, most of them for free. Why do I care if I have to learn a few knacks? It doesn't take too long. I mean, I think to me, the bigger issue is that knacks are great, not great for understanding things. They require experiential learning and time to develop. They lack transparency. They're not portable. And the thing you learn in one context doesn't apply to another one. So if we are to, if we're in a world that is proliferating in knacks, we are literally taking up brain space to figure out our local problems at the expense of more global ones. And the more things we create that require NACs to solve, the less common understanding is possible because all this mental energy is taken up solving these local problems. We struggle, as Richard Saulwerman would say, to extract value and significance from our organization of information, which means that it's not information at all. Jorge Arango just put this quote up a couple of days ago and I, I was so excited because I decided to make it part of the talk. This, this is one of the most profound things I've ever read. If you develop knackful systems 
a million times. You have a meaningless rattle trap world. This is not great. We have to find a way to fix it. I'm not going to pretend that this is easy. People are trying. Microsoft is spending huge amounts of money on IA and design, frankly, to poor effect. Apple cares deeply about user experience. We still ended up with a 20, uh, you know, 20 bullet point procedural document for clearing iPhone hard drives. So part of this is that the discipline of digital things made is practically brand new. I mean, really, really, if you think about it, people have only been asking questions about user experience between, pe between people and screens for about 50 years. We really don't have good languages and disciplines for understanding this world. But, you know, that shouldn't be an excuse because um, even though we're still kind of pre, I would argue, and it's going to sound a little crazy, we really are pre-architect -arch, pre in terms of architecture as a discipline in the digital world. Even though we call ourselves information architecture, we're still starting from first principles. If you looked at the the, the maturity and the, 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 the level of, of of uh, doneness of our techniques compared to say like a building architect or a, or, you know, like a, like a naval architect, it's a, it's a, it's a huge difference, but it shouldn't be an excuse because based on my experience as a tug in the last 10 years, I can say that the bigger issue is that people are asking the wrong questions and trying to solve the wrong problems. And when you ask questions and solve the right problems, software gets a lot better without doing anything to change the coding team, the technology or the business. So what are the right questions to ask and what are the right problems to solve? Well, first we have to create common contexts and then enrich them with understanding. And what I mean by context is a human-centered description of needs and mental states. Human-centered in this case means we describe the world based on what people are doing and thinking about situated in a specific place and time. And I think a lot of people agree with that. I think coders agree with that. Well, the part that seems to be often missing is understanding. Understanding and in information products is realized through vivid, clear, testable models of that context, and lots of them, to create alignment across a team so they can repeatedly double check that they are all building the same thing and building it for the right person. And this means that any description of a need includes some pretty specific things, but the key point is we're considering what users are bringing with them when they do their work. And in my experience, you know, you can have different levels of maturity, but the really egregious interfaces uh, are the ones that don't start with this basic premise. So when I mean context, I really am talking about stories, right? Uh, context properly done is a narrative of experience, not a list of conditions that describe the experience. The key thing here um, is that I'm not talking about a specification. Specifications are usually propositional statements about what a thing is supposed to do um, or what, what the expectations are of what that thing is, right? And so like we were talking about specifications for a cookbook, we might wanna say um, like a specification for the viable outcome of a single element, like the index allows me to find a recipe, right? Or you could talk about a description of the basic type of this product, which is an instruction manual with an index and a table of contents. Or you could talk about his functional purpose, right? To provide instructions for cooking, assuming a functional kitchen with some measuring elements. And there was a long time when this was what software requirements looked like. Um, context looks a little more like this, and this should sound very familiar to anybody I'm about to say. This is the way a 50 year old man who cooks regularly would use a cookbook in the kitchen. He needs to look up cuts of meat while planning his meals before he cooks. When he is actually cooking, he lays the cookbook down on a side counter because the book may be too big to put into a holder. He likes it when the book falls open to the page he's looking at and stays open. The pages will get spattered with food and the recipes he's look, he, who loves the most will be the ones that get spattered the most. He likes stories about the food because they inspire him to try different things differently when cooking a familiar recipe. And he likes to understand key details about the food, but not in a way that intrudes on his ability to cook it when time is short and he's actually making the meal. Kind of sounds like a persona, right? And, and that's why, you know, personas are pretty great, you know, and you can do a lot with them. The key thing is that uh, users' needs are not specifications, they're journeys, emotional and mental states and desires. They are, to put it another way, storytelling. And storytelling is pretty great. And here's the good news. Developers agree. 
generally speaking, right? Context exists everywhere in software today. It's become a best practice as a result of the agile revolution. The introduction of user stories and acceptance criteria dramatically improves software. And really as a framework, user stories and acceptance criteria, are pretty good tools for creating context. The problem is that a lot of people in organizations would stop there and they do for a lot of reasons. One of which is that their success criteria are off. Agile powered context processes allow people to produce software that matches the specifications on time and under budget. We're better at making things, right? We've got techniques and tools for making things. They're generally speaking like a bubble of a thing that somebody wanted you to make and you can do it in a three week period, right? There's a lot of, there's been a lot of success and people get whatever, when something works, you keep doing it, right? So it's a huge win when you think about what things are like in the 90s and even the aughts when, you know, the success rate of software projects was, was shockingly low. But if you stop at context, you can create something gnarly, right? You can create some gnarly stuff. Um, you can successfully deliver on a series of pretty clearly defined requirements on time and under budget. You make a tool that's dispiriting or even, see, this was supposed to be a unicorn, right? And what's the problem? It's got fur, it's got a horn, it's a mammal. It's a mythical beast because it's extinct, right? What's the problem? This is a unicorn, right? It hit all the acceptance criteria, you know? And, and so you can make a tool that's dispiriting or even bewildering to the stakeholders. And in my opinion, this is what happens when you have context without understanding, right? Understanding and in information products is realized through vivid, clear, testable models that create alignment across the team so they can repeatedly double check that they are all building the same thing and building it for the right person. And their team level and their project level, they're not sprint level. You can build sprint level models if you want, but you want models that are really covering the entire project. Otherwise you build it for the system or the person writing the code because that's the problem they've been asked to solve, right? It's not developer's fault that they make crappy stuff. I wanna be super clear on this. They're only doing what they're being asked to do. Homo logicus is a myth. Um, the remaining, remaining true to context empowered by understanding creates the beginning of, as Richard Sommelroom puts it, an understandable structure of information that we can extract value from. Okay, but how do we do this? The devil's in the details, right? How do we enrich context with understanding? There are three major approaches I'm gonna talk about today. Storytelling a strategy, modeling to gain alignment, and solving real problems instead of copying someone else's. And again, it's so weird because I, I just saw the keynote, the World ID keynote, and this language was in that keynote. And these I hadn't I didn't I did not watch the keynote, I swear to God. So it's, this is something that a lot of people are talking about right now. It makes me very excited because I think we're starting to come on to some common concepts that may be really important going forward as a community. Let's let's take the idea of uh, storytelling a strategy. Um, if we take the idea of context and take it to the next level, we can use it as a way to do strategic planning. And what Tug generally does in these situations, we create the frame of a story in the form of themes and then narrow that intent down in a workshop where the inherent tensions of those themes are discussed and prioritized by the client. The stories force you to make decisions about what you're trying to tell, what is important. If you tell that story, you also can't tell other stories and that's okay. Simplifying things takes courage because some of the, you know, some part of the tree must be pruned and stories pruned by default. Some things are not told, others are brought to the fore. Stories start to sculpt the clay. And I want to point out, right, this is not backlog grooming. Backlog grooming is the project management activity of prioritizing stories that have largely already been written or have already been signed off on in the strategic plan. So I already know I want to build this thing. Someone's going to write me a story or an epic to do it. I just have to figure out when it's going to happen and how and how much effort it's going to take. So the consideration process for how it got into the workflow has already occurred, right? This is this is a strategic level decision for figuring out the scope and form of the project in a bigger way. Um, so the the storytelling strategy, if you if you approach it the wrong way, you get a little bit of this tug of war going on, right? So what we try to do is not have a this versus that mindset when we make these decisions about tension, right? What we try to do is we tell these stories and, these, and, and, and the way they're manifested as tensions has this yet that. Try to honor all the things that people are trying to do because every stakeholder in that room has an opinion about why it is that one thing is important or not. 
each side of the continuum is a good thing. A current business strategy will typically call for emphasizing one or the other. So what's really interesting about storytelling as strategy is that, is that um, you are really naming all of the things you see, and then you're choosing to, to focus on something else, but you didn't forget the other things that happened. You just have said, we acknowledge this need because it really helps the team come together on all of the tensions that are within their organization. It also gives them a lot of freedom to talk about those tensions. Um, now, the, the, the approach Tug uses, which is pretty powerful, is we get as many stakeholders as we can into a room. And then we basically 14 or 15, if we can get it sometimes, I, I think the largest one I was ever in had 20 people and they vote on each of the tensions. And then we try to figure out the current state of those tensions. And we try to figure out where they wanna go. And at the end of it, we have these really cool maps where a lot of people shared their thinking because they talk out loud about why they're voting the way they're voting. And um, it gives us a vision for not just the story of what is being told now, but a place of where we're going to go, right? And as a result of that, we have a preference, we have a range of tolerance, and we have, uh, we have, we have agreement from everybody that this is going to be the scope of the analytics and the architecture effort that Tug has. But doing this by really naming all of the challenges, um, it really it really helps people feel better about the things that couldn't be done or the things that, that maybe are not being done right now. Now this is a this is a really powerful model, and it actually kind of gets to the key thing we have to do as as IAs I think all the time, which is that modeling is probably the most important thing we do. Um, a key thing about the digital world. And this is actually really, really important for people to understand. There's not, we need models more than anybody else because the physics of our world are, are infinite and changeable from context to context. When you build a house, there are certain forces, right? There's a reason that people talk about, you know, true, plumb, and square, right? If you have true, plumb, and square, you can build a house. You have three factors that allow you to basically frame a house up so it doesn't fall over. You can have true plumb and square in, in, the, in, the, in the digital world. First of all, it remains to be well-defined. And secondly, it, it differs depending on the thing you're trying to do. So without the extensive use of models uh, to help people understand both the problem and the perspective of other people about that problem, you can't do the work. You, you can do, you know, I mean, the key thing about using models in a good way with, in, as, a, as an IA is you basically have two objectives. The first is the true plumb and square, right? What, I would, what, what uh, Dan Klein calls form, fit, and forces. So the idea is that there are forces in the world that push down on a system that you're trying to, uh, uh, to create a form for. And then if you have a right combination of those forces in the form, you have good fit and you're gonna have something that looks good as a tool. This is a pretty abstract concept, but if you think about it, just about every model that we use, particularly when we're getting deeper in implementation is some expression of this, of this objective, right? But I think the more important use of the models are for alignment. Um, the models help teams maintain alignment by creating shared understanding. As many models are durable, you know, like you have a, if you get shared understanding on a model that's durable, it can last for years, right? It can be that model, that six foot wide banner that's on the wall of the, of the product manager who uses it to reference certain things that are going on in the project. Because what usually happens is people walk into a room and they think they're on, they have the same model, but they don't. So when you use a, a modeling tool to kind of surface and highlight their differences, you then can collaborate to create a common understanding of what you're really trying to do. And um, the best thing about that is you can do this in a small scale as a preliminary effort, an iterative effort, um, and then never use that model again, or you can use it for, for a model that's gonna go across the entire project. We generally assume that our models aren't very good and that we're gonna have to fix them. Um, in fact, the key to, to allow models to change as our understanding grows is, is a key part of our process, right? This is the, this is the iteration that, that Tug does. Um, you, we observe, right, often through user research, create models of what we saw, and then work to find alignment with the team based on those models. We then adjust them, observe people's reactions to them, make new models, and gain even stronger alignment. And one, one of the biggest differences between this and kind of traditional or historical specifications is they were, those were sort of canonized. People would say, this is the model of the system. You will do this thing, you know. We don't really have that. We have a, we have a, a process for understanding that generally creates some kind of model concept. And as we gain alignment and learn from it, it will change. As a matter of fact, we encourage our clients to help us change them. 
So models are there to, to gain alignment, help us with form, forces, and fit, but we also hold them loosely and expect them to change. Now, as you get deeper into IA, you'll find the number of models involved can be massive. This is a this is a slide from a talk that Peter Morville gave um, a couple of months ago about what, what is IA in terms of the different levels. And beyond these wonderful definitions of different kinds of IA, the thing that strikes me about this is that this, this list of stuff implies dozens of models, dozens of models, right? There are lots of kinds of maps, experience modeling. I talked about personas. You can have actually workflow models, understanding, governance. I mean, like you, you could literally, if, you, if you've been in this business for a while, you could probably think of three or four models for each of these words, right? And it's important. I always live on models because they do such a good job of highlighting things that need to be fleshed out as part of the original story, the original context. So learning how to model, discovering all the ways that models can be created is one of the most important skills an IA can have. And sometimes you just got to make one that no one's ever made before because that's how you solve a problem. But in order to do that, you have to practice making models. So, you know, it, the, because the problems are so diverse and so bes bes bespoke, right? So be a collector and a creator of models as you work to execute the plan created through storytelling. Um, it's critically, critically important. The third approach, and this is actually kind of, this is the pep talk part of the, of the talk really, is um, you got to solve real problems instead of copying someone else's problems, right? And, and this, here's, here's a way to think about this in terms of your, own, of your own experience and the way to kind of center what's going on in these projects. If you don't assert a design based on creating an experience a real human being wants to have, you won't make a thing that is good. And your job to some extent is to use models and understanding of information to represent, to be the avatar of that human being. Um, this isn't happening much. To be honest, you know, we live in a world that is not designed but imitated most of the time. We look at what other people have done and we think that's a good solution and we copy it. There are a lot of reasons for that, but that is that is the pattern that you see all over the all over the place. You basically just copy a design from somewhere else. But here's the thing: they're not, they're making a critical mistake, a critical mistake when they do that. They're not um, solving their problems by copying someone else's solution, right? They're copying the other person's problem. Think about this. How do we know what the problems were that created the solution that we're looking at, right? When you look at a completed embodied creation, you are looking at the distillation of a long effort of a lot of people working through questions that you don't get to see. So the solution represents a lot of thought and a lot of intentionality about what is actually going on in that system. And you know, the classic example of this is the statement, make it like Amazon. What people are really saying is, I wanna be successful like Amazon is successful and I sell stuff online. But Amazon's interface is the culmination of literally decades of problem solving that address their particular needs in their particular ways. This isn't to say that someone selling stuff online isn't gonna come up with ideas that are similar to Amazon's. But if they don't start with their problems, they will be solving someone else's problems and the digital thing made of information will be badly made because the information will be bad. So we really have to start with our problems and solve our problems, even though that is scary. And we'll talk about how scary that is in a minute. But first I want to be inspiring because there's a, there's a, there's a particular um, technology that has been very good at this for a very long time. And I think it's one of the greatest IA achievements ever created. And I think it's the cookbook, right? Think about for a minute how crazy a cookbook is. It's a collection of instructions intended to show people how to make things they've never made before involving hundreds or even thousands of ingredients. And people expected to, you know, find, you know, expect to find things based on what they like and the ingredients they have on hand. And they need to be something that just about anyone can use. And so, and, and the context of this is, is pretty broad. It's pretty broad and specific. That's the easy thing about cookbooks, right? You've got a kitchen where a kitchen is some kind of range in an oven. Some measuring devices, probably not a scale, but, but other, other measuring devices, and access to a grocery store. Beyond that, there are a lot of different ways to make a cookbook because they're each solving their own problem. And these are my two favorite cookbooks, right? Uh, America's Test Kitchen Family Cookbook was written by that collective. It's about 15, well, it was about 15 chefs that put this together. 
and The Joy of Cooking by Irma Rombauer, her daughter and her son-in-law. These are wonderful books, okay? Each of them is deeply steeped in the context of cooking in the United States. Um, and each of them has a great understanding of how cookbooks are used. Beyond that though, they're really different, okay? They solve their own problems in different ways. I love them both. Uh, not just because of the recipes, because of how their intent is embodied right there. Yeah, the test kitchen binder is, is pretty fragile. You can see the, the duct tape here because it, it broke about three years after we got it, it kept opening and shutting it. Sometimes the joy of cooking is a little too chatty, but they work. They reflect an intent and a vision, and that vision and intent are defended throughout. Uh, they said, I don't know if this will work, but I want to try it. And I just want to give you a couple of quick examples. The first is just how each cookbook allows you to find things beyond the table of contents, which are okay. The books embody findability. Test Kitchen has tabs by topic. Uh, the construction of the joy of cooking is such that uh, when you go to certain parts of the book, it tends to open those places more often um, and, and more frequently when you open it again. So basically, as you find more and more recipes that you like and you go there, the, the book will just fall open to those recipes. It's really cool. Um, and there's also a ribbon that allows you to bookmark new places you're exploring. So in this case, the more direct solution of the test kitchen is easy to use initially. It's a lot easier to find stuff initially in test kitchen. Joy Cooking is kind of a massive book. Problem is that as the book wears down, the tabs break off and it gets harder to find, right? And I've been using the Joy of Cooking for 20 years and the spine has never cracked, right? But the pages continue to provide increasing the numbers of implicit bookmarks. So both ideas had pros and cons and both work well. One of them represents a journey through cooking that will last your entire life. The other is about how to get things done, but you might have to buy another copy. The language in these books reflects two very different ideas about what cooking is, uh, about what cooking is. Test Kitchen is all business, right? Best tools, best approaches, best ways to make something. They justify their assertions by talking about how hard they tested it. It's really impressive. Um, that information is in the joy of cooking to some extent, but they also want you to they also want to invite you to discover things. They assume you want to be educated about food. And given the time each book was written, this is probably a reflection of some of the changing context. The joy of cooking book's a little bit older. Uh, it's, and it was really written, even in its original edition, it's the only cookbook you'd ever need, right? Test Kitchen is a little bit different. Test Kitchen's a distillation of all the recipes you knew about or tried before that maybe didn't work out so well. Um, and so, you know, they, they're like, this is how you make the, the awesome thing that you've tried to make before. So, you know, again, each one is telling a specific story about what they wanted. And I love these books, right? I love that they're both trying to solve problems in their own way. They reflect their own problem solving. And, and something you'll see over and over and over again is that where there is a great product, there's almost always somebody or bodies representing their values and identity in that product because the product represented something they thought was real. If you ever watched the, I don't have any videos of, of the Ron Bowers talking about cooking, but if you watched the test, there was Test Kitchen TV show for a while and they would talk about how they made it and they would discuss their problem solving process and all of that intentionality and effort went into the writing of that book, right? Um, I'm gonna talk about a couple other folks who did that as well. Coco Chanel was very famous for this. She made things she wanted to wear. Not because she wanted to get rich, but because they fit her lifestyle. Steve Jobs produced four magnificent examples of popular industrial design, the Mac, the iMac, the iPod, and of course, the iPhone. And in each case, they represented his values, his problem solving. So taking the things you learn from users and then saying, I will embody those needs. What I will make will reflect a problem that I am trying to solve as their avatar, their representative. It's probably the most challenging, important, and scary thing we can do to improve products. Typically, this role is, is, is managed by the product manager of a product, but they have a lot of other roles and needs. But an information architect is the keeper of the information can also do this, and they have the models to support it. So why is this hard? I think there are a couple of things. The first is that many companies don't want to build a thing, right? They want to build a thing that gets them something else that they really want. And usually this involves some other more complicated pain and they haven't taken the time to figure out how that pain can be addressed as a real problem and then embodied as the thing made. That transition between a vague or abstract target to a tangible digital place made of information is at the core of what information architects can do. We can help them figure out the thing that they actually are trying to make. It's important, there's some good warning signs. If your client's midway through a project, you're still saying things like, we wanna hit 20% margins on our efforts in 2022, or we wanna address our organizational challenges 
in communication, or if we want to display our product line so that people will see it and buy it, then the effort to create context enriched by understanding has not succeeded. And at best, you'll get something gnarly. But I think there's a second thing, and this is where I exhort you to be brave, okay? You might do the, you might be the avatar. You might do the work of enriching context with understanding. You might get something very concrete in your mind based on what you heard and the problem you want to solve. You might have Coco Chanel clarity. I will design a dress that I would want to wear to a party. And that's scary. Because you might not be Steve Jobs. You might, you might make this, right? It's possibility. It's possibility, you know? Solving your own problems means trying to find ways to make a dream come true in a sense. And that takes practice and patience. And sometimes you fail. Steve Jobs made the Lisa, okay? I don't know if you guys ever heard of the Lisa, but you probably haven't. Steve Jobs created stunning vaporware called the Next. Didn't work very well at all. It cost tens of thousands of dollars. Coco Chanel's fragrance number nine is, is the ninth fragrance. What happened to the other ones, right? But unless we go for it the way Homer goes for it, you know, nothing is designed and the products we make will continue, in my opinion, to be badly made because if you don't try, then somebody's, uh, somebody else's voice or somebody else's agenda will come in to solve that problem, right? On time and under budget. I hit the acceptance criteria. Who is it for? What's the information that you're using to solve that problem? So what does that do with our knackful, complicated, rattle trap world? I mean, here's the thing. People aren't going to stop making zillions of apps. The tools are out there. The opportunities are endless and the entry costs are relatively low. But each thing we build is a chance to start a conversation about what is the true understanding of a well-made thing. So I think a beautiful world is one of a million gorgeous messes, each one trying to solve a problem, but doing it in a good way. In the same way that there are a million cookbooks, some of which are exquisite, but each in their own way. We can't ask people to do this with standards. First of all, we aren't far long enough to have true standards. We don't understand the physics of the digital world. But even if we did, standards are generally a safety and, and guidelines for, for uh, quality or, or stability. So they would probably entail things that prevent software from killing us. In the same way that cars have standards, beyond collision safety, you can make them look any way you want, right? The diversity of the creativity is something that we should hope for instead of trying to squash down. So we're stuck with the messes, but we can make them better. We can organize the information so that people can extract value and significance from them. And this idea is simple. I know it isn't easy. There's dozens of techniques and practices, deep understandings of technologies and systems, a recurrent commitment to both personal vision and a shared context and understanding. It's a magnificent challenge. And I propose to you that information architecture gets us there better than anything else. This is based on my personal experience. I tried so hard to make good software. I failed so many times. I showed up a tug, just blew my mind, all right? I propose to you, based on over 20 years of trying to make digital things better, that this is the way to go. Information architecture tells stories to plan and then uses those stories to create meaning that can be learned across contexts. Information architecture is a practice of making sense of things and generating shared understanding through, through models. And it exists to help us understand what good means for us in that moment. And the more we do that across the systems we support and design, the better the world will be. The less we will rely less on NACs, the more we will return to shared understanding because we will be able to extract value from the concepts of the organized information. But to do it, you got to go for it. You got to go for it like Homer goes for it. That's my talk. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Daniel. Wow, that was a lot of information. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Went, went a little longer than I meant for it to. I, I <laughs> no, 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 you're good. I'm glad we had enough. We started a little early and so we had time to, you know, fully give you a presentation. Um, <clears throat> we had a lot of wonderful conversations going on in chat. Um, so someone wrote, um, your analysis of NACs as a negative way of configuring systems is really interesting since I usually consider a NAC in a non-IA context as a positive as in someone has a natural gift or aptitude. But in your critique of NACs due to the difficulty of their learning and translation universal applicability, oh, sorry, maybe I misread that. Um, so someone was critiquing that <clears throat> you said like NACs were 
due to the difficulty of learning and translating the applicability of creating problems? Oops. Yeah, so the knack, the thing about a knack, ha having the knack to solve a problem means that you, you've figured out how to do it in a specific local way mm -hmm. that is largely non-portable because it's usually experiential, right? Got it. Um, and so no, people who have a knack for solving things are wonderful. Right. It's great. I mean, my wife is probably really grateful that I figured out how to how to, you know, do the dishes with our with our sprayer, but the it shouldn't have been broken in the first place. Mm -hmm. Right. So so really the proliferation of Max is like it's great. This is a valiant way of solving a problem. And I'm glad that people are trying to do it. I'm glad that Google exists to show us the NAC, you know, to, 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 to socialize the NAC such as it is. But the biggest problem with the NAC is NAC does not tell you why a thing works. A NAC tells you how to solve a specific problem without any context. I'll, I'll give you a really uh, specific example. I worked for, we worked, um, Tug worked with a, a credit card processing company a few years back that had some very, very smart people doing tech support and sales support. And, and they were very complicated problems. And so people would call them up and they would help them solve the problem. And then they would take notes and figure everything out and they would write it down and they would send it off, right? So they had this whole training process based on what all these people were writing about the, what the problem was and how they solved it. And we would ask each one of them about the same problem. What do you think happened here? Why is this broken? And because their system was so rattle trap and so badly made, and there was so little affordance that they each would give different explanations. They had just so stories about why the thing was broken and they were all different, even though they were talking about the same data system. It's very, and that, that was their training model, right? So the way that they solved their problems in a local way, it worked well enough for them to solve it, but none of them understood how the system worked. Thank you for that response. Um, another question that we had was, how much would you say the issue of disconnectedness has to do with the lack of accountability? And when I say a lack of accountability, I mean across developers, designers, and stakeholders. It, it, that's a funny word for me. Um, I've, I have found, generally speaking, that everybody is trying really, really hard to do the right thing. Um, you know, and, and my, my sense as a manager, like I've grown organizations and I've, I've built things, is that is that usually a lack of accountability is, is a manifestation of a failure of another process. Um, so in this particular case, the developers are being completely accountable to their, to their scrum master and their backlog and their backlog, right? They're doing exactly what they were being asked to do. And a lot of times they're being, they're pushed back on something because they don't, uh, because, because they, they don't understand how to do it in the context that they have, right? So what I think is going on more than a lack of accountability is that the processes for making software are not sufficiently mature. Um, we have an engineering component of software development and we have a, a crafter component of software development, um, which, is the, which is really the development work. We don't have an architectural component of software development. They, they'll build system architectures, but that's really about how to get the... Uh, the electrons and the and the you know the business objects from one place to another faster with less friction, but they, we don't have an information story. We don't have something that represents what we're trying to make. So I think people are as accountable as the systems allow them to be. Thank you. Um, another one of the question we had was interesting that you used literal cookbook examples because whenever I heard this term in the workplace, like oh you're taking the cookbook approach. It is often has like a negative connotation mm -hmm. against creativity. How do you uh, counter that? Well, you don't have to use the cookbook examples if you don't want to. <laughs> yeah. um, the, the, okay, so this is the irony. This is why that's actually a really telling criticism. You can, you can make recipes out of a cookbook forever and not understand how any of it works, right? Cookbooks give you the instructions for solving a particular problem. Um, it was really only after I started watching videos of people making food and talking to, and, and, and actually like Alton Brown and that kind of, ex, and, and, and like uh, the explosion of the explanation of food that I, that I started to go deeper with food, right? So I am really thinking about the cookbook as a tool for getting something done and the, and the ways that, that that work happens, right? 
But um, I would say as a tool for gaining a deeper understanding of food, a cookbook's not a very good tool. As a way to um, know how to cook something, and to, and to kind of cook something in a particular context with a particular objective, it's a magnificent tool. So, so you know, I, I think that critique is fair. I wouldn't use this, I wouldn't necessarily use the cookbook as, a, as like, uh, it'll solve the problems, but I think the way people try to solve problems in making cookbooks is the, is the IA um, example. All right, thank you. Um, and last one is, while not, or like this is someone who put it in the comment here, um, while not your main focus, regarding copying other solutions when not having the same set of problems, is the common method of reusing code from Stack Overflow or GitHub in programming also problematic here? I feel like many programmers may think pragma pragmatically rather than from a frame of understanding. As long as the software works and I get my job done, use it. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, ultimately frameworks, are only as replicable as your ability to understand their boundaries and, and limitations. Um, and I, I, I think about when I was a system architect, there was a there was a framework called Turbine that I it was a Java uh, Java framework that allowed us to. I'm going to get a little technical here, but I just want to serve as an explanation. It allowed us to build business objects using individual lines of code without writing any SQL statements. Basically, allowed us to pull data out of a database basically with just with a function call or an object call. And it worked great until we started having to do complicated joins. So the moment we had to do complicated joins, we had to crack it open and write the code from scratch. And we hadn't, uh, that was not something that anybody had told us it couldn't do. We figured it out late in the project and it was, it was a pretty expensive uh, adjustment. And, and so the biggest challenge of using, of, of grabbing a framework or grabbing a, a, an API or something like that is, you know, again, you're, you are using someone else's solution to solve your problem. Uh, you, you're, you're solving, you're basically grabbing someone else's problem, right? And you don't know what your problem is. So, so asking questions intentionally about that will allow you to select a little better. That being said, the difference between tools and design is such that like tools always are imperfect. Um, the, the goal of information architecture is to is to show them to the developers and give them interesting technical challenges so they can choose the right tools. But, but um, I, I, I don't know a single developer who doesn't rely on frameworks or libraries to get things done. I wouldn't ask them to write stuff from scratch. Thank you. That was a really good point. Um, and before, if there's any more questions in chat, I'm going to give you guys like an extra minute um, while I go ahead and give some of my comments and feedback. Um, I just want to say again, thank you, Daniel. Um, I tell like, when you brought up uh, Apple, I was just like, oh yeah. Like we expect them because we, as they're Apple, right? Like, oh, they're the best, the best information architecture, right? They have great UI, great UX. Like they understand their end users. Um, but right, when you brought up that point, it's just like, well, they, right, they don't have everything. Um, How about the so alarm we, button where the alarm button says pause, it's the same button that yeah. says pause on some screens, but stop on stop. other screens, but it's the same color. It's like, oh yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then um, I was going to say, for me, I've always had this issue of like assumptions are very dangerous. I like how you brought that picture of like, you know, the triangle, the square, the circle. Mm -hmm. And then, right, we were all like, oh, yeah, we, we all understand what's going on, right, because of our false assumptions. And so I always tell uh, a lot of my friends, like, don't assume. Um, make sure to verify. Uh, I'd rather you verify, you know, spend the time to go verify something than just assume that you, you're doing it right. Um, and I also want to say, I appreciate you bringing in engineers into our discussion. I know for a lot of uh, students here that we always kind of think of ourselves as the designer, the developer, the QA tester, the end user, right? We are the ones usually going through the whole process unless we have some projects that are working with like external stakeholders. Yeah. Um, and I think people need to be mindful too, like they're also part of this discussion. So yeah. when they're building these tools, oh, right? So important. I, I didn't I actually pull this out of the talk, but your allies, you are not you need designers and developers. You, they need you and you need them. It's, it's, if they can do things you can't do and vice mm -hmm. versa. And if, if, if we don't come in with that conversation that we're here to solve problems together and really like our role is to help them have more fun doing the things they want to do anyway. Um, it, 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 that should be the, that should be the approach. Absolutely. You know, right. Okay. And then I think those were all of my comments. Give me one second, I'm trying to find the chat, see if there's any other questions. And I don't see any more. 
Um, and just a reminder everyone that we do have Daniel. Um, he did post his LinkedIn. I'm gonna go ahead and drop it again in the chat for people who might have just arrived. Um, and you can always connect with him that way as well as um, maybe you have some, you can message him on that channel and maybe get his email if you're interested. Uh, again, thank you, Dana, for coming out on Saturday morning and you know um, talking fun. to us. Great. Oh, that's good to hear. Can, oh. I'm actually going to stay a little longer because these talks sound really great. I'm going to stay as long as I can. So thank you guys for having me. And it was really great being here. Yeah, thank you. And I'm hoping for next year we can all be in person. <laughs> uh, that'd be great. Okay, yeah. so Bye. it is. Bye. And so it is 1010, everyone. Um, I do want to give a break uh, just because that was a very thoughtful conversation and there was a lot of great ideas going around. And so I know for me, I need to process some of those ideas. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put on some music for the next 10 minutes. Um, and then we're going to come back at 1020. And then if we might uh, wait another like five minutes, uh, potentially, but we're gonna, right now I'm going to set time just for 10 minutes. Um, so we can all have a break and use, you know, restrooms. All right, we'll be back in 10. Hello everyone, we're back and in a new room. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna be having um, Shannon come join us. I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen real quick. And in this time, I'm gonna go ahead and give Shannon some co-host powers. All right. Oh, we do have someone entering. Hold on a second, Shannon. Yeah, no worries, you're good. Um, and then we do, we can see your screen and we can hear you. Okay, awesome. Um, but yeah, hey everyone. Um, so I'm Shannon. Uh, thank you all for joining today. Um, super early in the morning on a Saturday. So I really appreciate that. Um, and it's also kind of like in between of the semester. So I really appreciate everyone's time. Um, but yeah, so I'm Shannon. Um, I'm currently a fourth year undergrad here at University of Michigan, um, School Information, and I'm gonna be presenting about design systems today. Um, so this isn't typically about um, information architecture, but um, what's really core to uh, designers, but also having uh, producing and delivering more efficient designs um, is the importance of having a design systems within teams. Um, and this helps to connect um, designers of cross-functional team members, but also um, to help ensure that a lot of different brands and organizations out there can still keep intact across different functions and different departments um, when they're working on different products. So that's uh, part of the reason why I decided to take a different direction um, for uh, World Information Architecture Day and emphasize a different aspect of design in terms of really connecting designers cross and cross-functional teams, as well as also end users. Um, and also in terms of like the format of the presentation, there is like an outline um, on Figma when it comes to presenting. It's it kind of like uh, when it's a prototype, um, it, it presents itself like this. So um, if anyone's having difficulties like seeing the screen, you can just let me know and I'll try my best to like zoom in. So just a bit of intro about me. Um, I'm currently an undergrad um, studying user experience design. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. and very passionate about career advocacy. So I've been doing a lot of that um, within that space. And also um, I'm currently right now researching with Oliver Hameson. Um, I don't know if anyone's have interacted with him, um, but he's a super awesome professor. I know he currently teaches an undergrad course. I'm not sure about graduate level, um, but he does a lot with like social technologies and a lot with um, a lot of like queer focused um, research work. So sort of an outline um, for what I'm gonna be presenting. Um, sort of my first one's gonna be an introduction about visual design systems. Um, the second portion is about what makes a visual design system, the different components um, that when you put them together, um, holistically creates a visual design system. And then why visual design systems are super important, um, not only when you're creating different designs, but also um, how it works within larger organizations, as well as lastly, creating interactive components. So um, a big part of visual design systems is learning how to create interactive components. Um, and I'll be showing on Figma how, how to actually create that. And um, I'll show like a fundamental in terms of like creating interactive components. Um, and from then on, you can sort of build off from that. And that's super critical and important when it comes to actually creating design systems. 
So sort of an introduction. Um, and also if anyone has any like questions, you can always drop that in the chat and uh, throughout the entire conversation as well, if there's anything that might be confusing and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, so for visual design systems, um, I don't know how many students have heard of visual design systems um, prior to this, but it's essentially a collection of reusable components and elements. So they consist of different user interface elements, um, and that ranges from components to patterns. Um, there's also uh, clear principles that really guide visual design systems and how you, um, how different teams and designers within the organization um, leads their design. And it's important, especially when you're trying to keep intact with the brand identity, as well as ensuring that your designs um, convey the certain principles that you, you outline for that specific project. Um, and it's essential for um, sort of delivering consistency, but also in terms of like scaling designs. So when you're going across different frameworks, um, different devices, and also um, to different functions of the organization, it does help in terms of scaling your design, but also creating this shared language across different cross-functional teams. Um, and these are just a few examples of, of really robust um, design systems out there. So Google has a very clear material design system. MailChimp has a really popular design system. And all of this is pretty open on, um, online. So if you search up for their different design systems, it's, it's available. Um, and they're a really good reference in terms of understanding how design systems are outlined, as well as um, how they can be applied to your own design projects and how you can create your own design, design systems for your own respective projects. Um, and one of the key principles I want to outline and that connects really well with World Information Architecture Day is that design systems aren't merely just a collection of UI components. Um, they provide context and also are a system of concepts that provides more information about how you will use certain components, how they're applicable to different projects. And they're really important, especially when you're trying to transfer work across different teams, um, because certain components can be reusable across different contexts. And that's something that's often overlooked about design systems. And it, it really does serve more than just a collection of UI components that you can just use within your designs, but they provide a lot of context um, and information about different use cases that you can use within your design. And then these are two other very popular design systems as well. Um, Shopify Polaris, you might hear about it quite a lot within the design system space. Um, it's probably one of the most used um, examples about design systems. Um, they have a really great outline in terms of the content, in terms of content design, um, different UI components that are used, um, how you outline different experiences, um, as well as uh, guiding design principles. And then um, sort of a different type of example. Um, so this is less of a UX design system. It's more of a general design system when it comes to creating actual physical products. So Nike obviously um, does a lot within shoe design. So for them, um, it's, it's less about the software interface um, space and it's more about creating actual like, shoes. And they have a design system specifically with how they design their shoes. And one of their guiding principles are sustainability. Um, and that's, that's an example of ways in which they try to integrate design principles to help guide their visual design systems. And it's really important to help create consistency across all touch points of any design that you're, you're creating. And the next part, I'm gonna move on to different components of design systems. So um, the most commonly known portion of the design system are style guides. Um, a lot of students probably have used this in the past with a lot of your projects. Um, they have a range of different um, aspects that you would utilize in your designs um, that a lot of designers would, would basically apply to their own design across different designers within a team. So you have, for example, color, um, typography, iconography, and also grid systems. Um, these are just a few examples of what would make a style guide. And they are very different from pattern libraries and component libraries, um, which I'll explain. Um, moving forward, um, but style guides are a critical part of part of a design system. It's, it's to help ensure consistency across all of your designs and making sure that um, any branding that you have is uh, shared across your entire design when you're working with different designers, uh, especially when it comes to version control where you aren't able to synchronously work together. So having this style guide when you're using, when you're designing um, ensures that every single designer on the team um, knows which, um, you know, hex color code to use, um, which font to use, and the certain, certain types of icons they would use as well. 
And then component libraries. So one of the biggest parts of design system is understanding it in more of a um, more of a more of a system in which you have like atoms, for example. Um, you have organisms. So if you're if you recall just from your past, you know, in middle school or high school, where you've learned about those different systems where you have atoms, organisms, and so forth, it's very similar in terms of you want, um, in terms of creating design systems. You're sort of building the fundamentals out and eventually taking all those UI components and putting putting them together to create larger, larger systems. So component libraries are essentially um, components that um, really define a lot of what you would use when you're, you're designing. So for example, you would have form fields, um, buttons, for example, um, toggle buttons, you know, navigation, um, different components like that. And eventually when you build up those components, um, you eventually make pattern libraries. And essentially pattern libraries are taking those UI components and putting them together. So for example, if you have like a menu bar, um, each individual individual sec section of a menu bar would be a component. But when you put all of those different parts of a menu together, they make up a pattern library. And as you're building this out um, with your design system, it becomes very important. Um, eventually when you when you reach the stage of actually documenting your designs um, and including why you're using certain components, uh, why you're using certain patterns and also colors. Because when you're working with other cross-functional team members, for example, um, engineers, um, giving them that context in terms of why we're using certain components, um, how these components should be designed is to ensure that there's no design inconsistency when you're communicating with all of these cross-functional teams. And also for, uh, for engineers to not make their own design decisions um, um, as that's the role of the designer. Um, and that often happens a lot when there's no clear direction of the design um, and design systems helps to clarify those miscommunication gaps. And then another portion of design systems that are often um, overlooked is documentation. Um, very much like component libraries and pattern libraries, documentation is probably the, the, the most overlooked about design system. It's, it's probably one of the most important part, especially since design systems are growing across a lot of organizations. Um, I know a lot of companies out there are still building out their visual design system, which has caused a lot of confusion and uh, difficulties, but it is really important when it comes to actually integrating that within your, your teams. Um, and it's something that a lot of companies are trying to jump on that bandwagon and also be able to integrate design systems within their orgs. Um, so documentation is basically really writing out why you're using certain um, components, why you're using certain colors, um, typography, and so forth. And the reason why this is super important is because as a lot of products and services are constantly changing over time, um, things are updating. And because of that, you know, if you're going to transfer your work to future designers or other cross-functional team members, um, having this documentation is really helpful. Um, so they know exactly why certain components can be used, how they can apply that to future products and services that they're, they're currently designing. Um, and a good example is, uh, for example, like a button. Um, when you document why a certain button is within those states, so you have like a hovered state, um, when a user is clicking or pressing a button, uh, what examples or use cases that would occur within your design as a user is interacting with it. So other future designers have insights in terms of why those buttons are designed the way they are. So if they have other systems out there that they're currently designing that has that exact same or similar use case, um, they can apply that moving forward. And there's no, that, there's no like miscommunication gap when it comes to why certain components are designed the way they are. And then the next one that we're moving forward to is just like the values of design systems. Um, I think I uh, sort of mentioned a lot in terms of the importance of a design system. Um, I will always advocate for a design system. I think it's super important. And I know as a student, we often don't recognize that importance because with the time frame that we have for a lot of class projects, it's very difficult to actually do all of that and within that time frame of having just like one or two months. So, but I think down the line, you know, as a designer, um, it's something that should be advocated within a lot of your design projects, um, within your teams, and also within organizations, because it does have, a, I think it has a large impact in terms of long-term um, success within a lot of design projects out there. Um, so the first one would be, the most commonly known one is consistency. So it's just ensuring that all your designs are super consistent, whether it's different brands within a larger organization, um, just ensuring that 
their brand identity is intact, um, but also to ensure that any sort of components that are used, you know, one, um, one, t uh, one text, for example, on a screen doesn't have a different font from another. Obviously, we make make it seem like an entirely different ecosystem. So because of that, uh, design systems are super important to ensuring a consistency across, um, across organizations, across teams and, and projects. Um, the next one is scaling. So when it comes to actually um, scaling your design and when it comes to scaling, there's different interpretations of that. So scaling could mean um, just increasing the different like sizes of your frame screen. When you're scaling, you also wanna make sure that there's a consistency in terms of how you're designing um, whatever interface you're you're currently working on, um, and that could, and for example, grid systems would be very helpful um, just to make sure that the the way you're spacing a lot of your elements and your components are, are still aligned with each other despite the different uh, frame sizes. Um, and also, scaling could also be um, when you're working on more projects within the team and organization, um, and you're you're building up, you're releasing new features. Um, you know, it could be if could be large or, or small scale features, it just helps when it comes to just ensuring that you're, you're super consistent across the board with your designs as you're moving on to more projects and adding on more features or, or different um, different projects that the team might be working on. Next one is a shared language and vision. So it's primarily for working with other internal designers, but also with cross functional teams like engineers and product managers. Um, and it helps to create this North Star vision. Um, North, Star, North Star is pretty commonly used within industry. Um, it's basically how you would envision your product once it's used. Um, so they would have an outline of, this is ideally like the impact this product would have if it was designed, fully fleshed out and developed. And it's, it's to help ensure, design systems help to make sure that everyone on the team is on board um, with how this design will move forward with. And this is super important because one of the biggest challenges is cross-functional collaboration. And it just helps to ensure that everyone, you know, product managers knows that these are some of the trade-offs that we're having, you know, how will having this type of design might affect, you know, the cost, the timeline, um, the business needs and so forth. So having that open and transparent uh, space to just have those communication about how we want to move forward with design um, is super important and design systems help with that decision-making along the way. And the last one is context. So one portion that I mentioned about design systems is documentation. Um, it's super important uh, within design because you need to have um, explanations of why you're using certain components, why you're designing the way they are. It's really about the rationale behind your decisions. And it's helpful for other future designers as well who are gonna work on you know, projects who might be using your components as well and want to understand why, you're, why you design it the way you are and it, uh, why you design certain components the way they are. Um, and also context behind design systems um, really helps understand how you're gonna address the user needs. And that's really primarily driven from a lot of user research that you're gathering. Um, both in data, uh, data collection, but also data synthesis. And having that context um, helps to validate a lot of, you know, your design decisions that you're making, why um, very trivial, you know, design decisions that you're making, for example, even like color that you're using, for, uh, uh, for example, can be a huge design decision that you're making and explain why you're using certain colors um, or why you're, why you're gonna include this, this feature, for example, like a search feature. Um, is, is really critical because it helps to validate based on your user research and, and how they will actually meet the user needs and their, address their pain points as well. Um, yeah, so that was quite a lot of information, but um, that was just like an introduction to, you know, visual design systems, what makes a visual design system, um, as well as why they're super important. Um, they're often underestimated. I think it's really valuable to have a lot of, within a lot of your projects. Um, I hope that helps deliver that. Um, and the next component that I'm gonna be explaining is a portion of actually, a portion of creating a visual design system and at its fundamental is called interactive components. Um, and basically interactive components are, they allow you to create prototype interactions and they help define interactions across fit variants within a component set, which I'll, I'll clarify what that means. Um, and basically they help with reducing prototyping complexity, but also it does save a lot of time when it comes to 
creating your designs, but also prototyping, also communicating your designs to other people out there. Um, when I first discovered about interactive components, um, especially since Figma is always constantly changing over time, updating with new features and so forth, it has saved a lot of time and a lot of clarification when it comes to communicating my designs. So I hope this is super helpful with you know, students, but also professionals out there who want to learn about interactive components and hopefully can integrate that into their future projects as well. Um, so essentially, um, and this is like kind of the last portion that I have, um, which will take up the rest of um, this 30 minute talk um, about creating interactive components. And I'll just have one little like tutorial that I'll like walk everyone through and you can follow along or if you just want to look at the screen, that's totally okay as well. But essentially interactive components, what they allow is that um, what I used to do as well um, before I knew about interactive components is that I would create separate screens so if I wanted to show that, you know, if you want to click a button, for example, and, you know, I don't know, you're signing into an account, um, you oftentimes what, what I used to do and a lot of designers used to do is we would just create a separate screen. You know, you would show, you know, you're clicking a button or you're unclicking a button and showing those state changes over time. And I would have to, you know, duplicate my screen. And what interactive components that allow you to do is you can immediately just have one screen. And when you click on, um, that one screen, it will immediately just have the change state. So what it does is it reduces the amount of um, screens that you have. And when you think of it from a larger context, if you have so many different functions within a, within one screen, um, it, it, it you'll be duplicating so many different screens and it becomes super messy. And you can imagine the amount of like links that you have on Figma and it just becomes super messy and difficult. So interactive components allows you to have everything in one screen and it just reduces the complexity and and just the messiness of having to communicate that with other people um i hope that clarifies essentially what, what interactive components do and, and this is just like i hope is a good visual of understanding um without interactive components and also with interactive components and how this relates to visual design systems is that you probably have seen when people search up visual design systems you have this is just like a small outline of different states that you have. So the component that I'll be focusing on is buttons. Um, so for example, you have default state. Um, when a button doesn't work, for example, um, without an icon or with an icon. So these are different, you know, you, when you, you are building larger systems, you have all these different variations of, of a certain component, in this case, a button. And this becomes helpful because when you're changing, when the user is interacting for design, they're constantly changing their state of the component and we don't want to have to duplicate every screen to show those um, changes as the user is interacting and we just want it on one screen and just to clarify when i say um variance um it, there's gonna be two words that are super important when it comes to interactive components um which i'll describe is the two most important that everyone should probably know and it's probably the only two that you would really know with interactive components is variance and essentially variants are they're just different variations, um, as the word uh, as the word has indicated, is just different different variations of a button. So it could be different colors. Um, if you're adding an icon to it, if it's an outline button instead of, instead of a filled button, and variants are basically basically just a way to define all these different variations of your component. And then properties are essentially they help define um, how you would categorize all these different changes. So for example, from a from a higher level category of like if you're defining red versus purple, like obviously that would be under the category is color. So properties are essentially just defining all these different uh, ways of categorizing your, which uh, I guess which um, uh, which part of your component you're you're going to be changing. So it could be the state, the lining, the icon, and so forth. Um, and each property has their own values. So these are basically different attributes um, to your variant. So you know, as example, um, the color red and purple would be the value of the property color. Um, yeah, so um, basically this is outlined right here um, and it's very helpful um, when it comes to creating visual design systems that you're building it out when you have all these dif different ways of defining um, your components. So, the last portion is walking through how to create an interactive component. Um, I just figured it'd be easier, especially when you're trying to demonstrate things to like walk people through it than just having pictures and, and um, 
just explaining it to them because it's very different when you're explaining what these definitions are uh, versus actually walking through how to create one. Um, so this one I took from Figma. Figma has, uh, the Figma community has a lot of great libraries, uh, design systems, and also um, just educational tutorials about learning um, how to create different uh, things in Figma. So interactive components could be one, um, using branch, branching reviews um, as another and, and so forth. Um, and I just took this one slide from Figma community in one of their, their files, but I will be walking through um, how to actually create um, interactive component at its foundational level. Um, and essentially what I'm going to be showing is something very similar to what I've taken from um, the Figma file. And we're going to be creating something similar to this where you have different selections. So typically when you're without interactive components, what you would have is um, we would, um, a lot of designers would actually like have to duplicate their, their screen, the screen that they currently have. Um, to show that they're clicking all of these different, you know, selections that they have when it comes to toppings. And instead of having to create all those screens to show each individual click, which obviously becomes super messy when you're trying to um, give users more flexibility in terms of clicking different options, you know, and you don't want to have to create all these different screens to show you click this first option versus the second one, third and fourth one. And it just becomes a lot. So instead of that, we'll just have what interactive components allow is you can have this one screen um, this one, yeah, this one screen in which you can just click, you know, and unclick. So I'm going to show this like super foundational one and it becomes very helpful as you're building other components out there. And just knowing this foundation can serve, serve you really well as a designer um, and help you bring it to a larger context within design systems. Um, yeah, so I'm going to show you guys how to do that. And you guys can like just watch me or you can walk like walk through it, but I just figured it'd be easier um, if I just walk you guys through it so you don't have to like like uh, process what you see on the page and then what you see on Figma. So essentially what we'll be creating is this right here. Um, and I just outlined essentially what you would have at the end um, when you're using interactive components. So I'm just gonna move this over so I'm gonna create a new one. Um, I'm going to duplicate this screen. I'm going to delete all these labels so we can restart. And if you have any questions, you can just drop it on the screen. And I can always like walk through it later. Um, again, if anyone has needs any clarifications. So if we start with this one label, so essentially for this, um, it's on, it's just an auto layout frame where I have the rectangle you just uh, create a rectangle that's uh, has no filler um has an outline um as well as a label so very simple you just create um your little selection with a label and a button uh, not a button a label and also like this little checkbox and what i do next is that once you create your original variant so uh, your original component um you want to create a variant of it and a variant of it would be for example this label right here where it's filled so this is the original component that you have and you also want a a variant of that so the one that's filled um what you do first is that the first step to creating any uh, the first step to create interactive components is to first create a variant so to first create a variant is you would want to make this a component so in order to make a component, you see this little like uh, rotated uh, four, uh, four square, uh, four square um, icon. So it says create component. Um, you simply just create a component. Um, and essentially what it does is that components are, are shared. Um, so what it allows you to do is that if you look at your local components, you can always reuse them. Um, and essentially right after that, once you create a component, what you can do is create a variant. So if you look on your right sidebar, um, it says variants right there. You essentially just create a variant. Um, and what it does is that it immediately duplicates for you an extra variant. And what you can do is that you can change this variant on your own in terms of what version you want this component to be. So for this variant, it's going to be a filled checkbox. So similar to this, I'm just going to take the rectangle that we have here. Um, I'm going to adjust it. So okay, 
So I'm gonna make this. Um, okay, I'm just gonna move this back. And you can always adjust like the sizing of your component. So And then after that, um, so this is a different variation of it. Um, let me just make sure the auto layout. Also, if anyone has any questions, you can always let me know, or you can always unmute yourself as well. Um, I don't think I can see the chat as well, but you can just drop that in. But um, I'll fix the auto layout later, but just for the time sake, um, what you would do next is that once you have your second variant, um, what you would do is on the right-hand side for clarity's sake, um, you essentially would change the way you name um, certain properties and variants. So for this case, if you click on the entire frame, you can change the properties over here. We can name it, for example, the check state. So this is sort of like the higher level category of how you would ca categorize um, this component. And then afterwards, um, you would indicate what your check state is. One of the cool things about Figma is that if you, um, if you have a, a property that can take a Boolean value, so a true or false, they will populate this toggle switch that you can use to just turn on or off um, your check state. Um, or you can simply just say like, name your the value of that property as like checked or unchecked. So this one would be checked um, and this, this one would be default or you can just say like unchecked. Um, or you have the option of doing true or false. Um, let me show everyone that. So this one would be true be false. Um, and then what you can do um, before we do that is the next step part is you would have um, prototype, you would have to prototype this. So essentially we, we would basically just you go over here, um, you go into the little prototype section. Um, all you have to do is just move this over here um, and move this. Oh. Click on the little square. So you move over here. And then if you want to unclick it, you just move over here. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, this basically would allow for users to like unclick or click certain um their the certain label selection. Um, so if we just like run this, uh, if we take an ex take out or if you just like take a copy of this, if you go in your assets, um, or you can just duplicate this. Um, if we try to run this, let me just put this over here, or we could just leave it here. Sorry, I think my screen. Okay. Um, I don't know why it's moving to second screen, but um, essentially, basically, what would happen is when you click on this button, very much like when you click over here. Maybe. Um, there might be one portion um, of this that's not clicking well, um, but essentially this would, once you have a duplicate, it would work in that when you click on this button, um, it should unclick itself. Um, very much similar to how this one was working over here. Um, and essentially um, that's what makes the interactive component and that you don't have to like duplicate different screens um, in order to actually make that work. Um, and you can just immediately have that in one spot. Um, yeah, I'll, I will work through this as there's like questions coming in. Um, I think there just might be one minor thing that I might be overlooking why this is moving to different screen of the, the presentation, but um, yeah. if there's any so, like questions anyone has about like 
I address this. I'm happy to answer along the way and like multitask on this. Awesome. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and help facilitate that. Um, so the first thing that I want to ask you though is, is it okay if we drop your LinkedIn in the chat? Um, yeah. Do and that. then do you want to share this Figma? If so, if you can drop the link in the channel. Yeah, I can share that. Um, I'll do that in a few minutes. Yeah. Sure. sure, no problem. And then, um, so, so we have a question in the chat from Daniel, and his question was, do you have any thoughts about integrating design systems with UX organizing principles like OOUX? And then um, you can also come up and mute too, if you need to. Go ahead, Jen. Or wireframes. Yeah. Yeah, could you repeat the last part? I think I might have missed you. Yeah. So do you have any thoughts about integrating design systems with UX organizing principles like OOUX? Um, so I've never heard of OOUX before, but when it comes to integrating like guidelines and principles, um, the most common one that I have used is accessibility. Um, and that's, I always keep it less of a checklist and more of forefront of a lot of my, my designs. Um, and when it comes to integrating that um, within your design system, it's important to have conversations early on with a lot of cross-functional teams. So when you're working with engineers or product managers, whether that's in the form of like um, agile development or um, when you're when you're having your stand up every week, um, it's important to have that conversation before you actually go and design your systems um, to have those conversations about how, what what principles we guiding. Um, your project, um, your design systems, and that's really led by um, the project and the end product that you're you're going to be designing um, and you're going to be delivering out there into the market, um, as well as also the brand. Um, you know, for example, if we think about certain companies that focus on like editorial, for example, um, there's certain like principles that are super important um, to guide those projects. Um, obviously, accessibility would be one of them. Um, ensuring that different readers can actually read their content on the screen. Um, another one could be like cross device experience, um, ensuring that people can have access to different devices across different, different circumstances. It could be um, people who are using iPad versus a larger uh, device or a smaller device and making sure that whatever product or interface you are designing um, can actually transfer across these different devices. That could be another principle. And it really depends a lot on the project that you're working on and what's your, what brand you're trying to align with um, and just making sure that it aligns well with um, those guidelines and principles and the way you're outlining your, those design tenets um, meet those, as well as also the user needs that you've, you've gathered from your research end. Um, I hope that clarifies. Um, actually, I've never heard of OOUX, um, but if you want to like explain that, that would be great. And I can see if I can o provide insight. O o UX is a, it's a principle for organizing interactive elements on a, on a, on a page that relates back to, to, to objects. So they're, they're trying to, they're trying to match up uh, objects like conceptual, like objects, data objects to an interactive element on the, on the page, but, but even wireframes, right? I mean, one of the things about wireframes is wireframes usually lack sufficient interactive and design inputs right they're, they're usually like containers for information and so like i, I one of the questions come up was i'm making wireframes <clears throat> if i make this wireframe am i using the right design principle uh in my wireframe to achieve some of the you know some of the the, the ultimate interactive goals that, that's of the content that's going to be inside it mm. yeah again <laughs> go ahead jen um, I was going to say, um, the, like, uh, Keith also posted in the chat, uh, so everyone knows that he put down what he's a fan of, which is the, a guide to application architecture. Um, and we do have someone with a follow-up question, which was going off of Daniel's question, what role do you think models play in the interaction design process? Yeah, um, so in models, um, do you mean in terms of, I guess, like, what type of models are we referencing? Because um, I think there's different types of models within design um, and different like ways of uh, visually describing different flows. Um, yeah, Jeff, do you want to come off from you? If you want to clarify your question, you can go ahead and type it out. Uh, yeah, which, whichever. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was either thinking mental models, action flows, user flows, whatever you want to call them. Um, yeah. Um, 
so for visual design systems, uh, mental models, um, for visual design systems specifically, it's less of a mental model. It's more of an organization um, of how you want other cross-functional teams to be able to, uh, how other designers can actually use your components. Because um, when you're sort of outlining all of these different components that you currently have, um, it's less of how people how people process and and what they think one page will go to like how they think you know one page would lead to the next. Um, it's more of how you can organize your design systems in a way that when other designers are using the components, it's very clear to them um, what each component does as well as um, how each uh, designs are outlined, so that when they're using it their own, in their own context. Um, it can fulfill a lot of the similar use cases um, for a lot of their user needs in their own individual projects. So I think for design systems, it's less of a mental model focus because it is for internal designers to use, um, but it helps facilitate connectedness across different teams uh, just to make sure that everyone has a shared vision in terms of how this project will move forward with. And it's, and it's just ensuring to make sure that a lot of your designs are super consistent. Um, but I hope that helps answer your question. Um, mental models, I think, are, are primarily more for end users and visual design systems in many ways does serve end users in that it helps to you know, deliver an end product that will meet the user's needs, but also is, is something that, you know, as we consider like user-friendly, um, accessible and so forth. Um, but for design systems, it's, it's less of a mental model, it's more of organization purposes. Awesome. Yeah, uh, thanks. I just had one follow-up question. Um, <clears throat> I know affordances get used a lot these days, and there's there's a lot of times like a difference in meaning. Um, I feel like I've heard a lot more like visual designers talk about affordances as um, the objects lining up for users, which what it seems like they'd be able to do, whereas like the previous definition of affordances could be more of just like the action space of objects um and I was just yeah wondering if if that had like a, a role as well in how you're thinking about the uh, interaction design yeah um so I think affordances um they are super important um if we I know a lot of classes within UMSI um I think the ones that are focused on um, more of an intersection between psychology and um, UX. So for like the undergrad level, I think it's like the ancient HCI. And I think the, under, the graduate level is like something like human behavior. Um, and I think affordances are super important with visual design systems. Um, and it's more of when we think about actually creating your components and how we want to provide those affordances. So when users are able to have those visual cues to know what the next steps are um, and that really builds off across different principles that guides a lot of, you know, UX guidelines. Um, you have like Hicks law, uh, Fitz law, and so forth, all these different like laws that we can't currently have out there to help inform a lot of our design decisions. Um, they definitely help give users a lot of guidance so that when it comes to like the learning curve of actually learning how to use a product, it isn't super high for them. And they know, you know, what the next steps are. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why there's um, one law out there where it, I think it's Jacob's law, where it, it deals with um, building systems are very similar to other systems out there. So users don't have to go through that whole effort of actually having to have that learning curve and have to relearn how to use a product or service. It, it does can lead to higher abandonment rate. Um, but I think affordances are super important. I think that there's a fine line between being creative and innovative versus creating something that people are used to. Um, I think that's something that's super tricky to figure out at the moment because um, you want to you know, create new products be more innovative, be more creative. But at the same time, we also want our products and services to actually be something that users um, can easily learn as well. Um, but I think affordances play a huge role in helping shape, helping to shape that um, and giving them cues to know what the next steps are so they aren't super lost within your system. Because um, it can be super confusing when it comes to the entire you know, design system and the product that you currently have. There's so many layers and steps to it and affordances help to bridge that gap um, and it, it's very helpful for more of a visual design context when you're actually creating your components. Thank you, Shannon. Um, we do want to give everyone a 10 minute break. Um, there was an extra 
um, question in the chat, but if you want, you can answer it during the 10 minute break we're going to have soon. And I just want to highlight, um, I, I know you, we have a student speaker this time at, this year around, and I just want to say I appreciate this um, just because uh, many people don't know this, but I am the president of the student org for computer interaction here at uh, the School of Information and here as a presenter and speaker for you guys here at Wyatt, but I don't come from this kind of background um, because in healthcare, we don't have a lot of design principles um, when we talk about like electronic health uh, record systems. And so for me, it was such a thing of like, I need to be more cognizant of this space. And so I really appreciated that this like summarization of like design systems, um, just because then it helps me as a developer, as well as like a translator, right? Communicate these needs um, across different stakeholders. So I wanna thank you, Shannon, for this. Um, and that even though we have a lot of professionals in this space, like. Um, right, we all have our own experiences and viewpoints to a uh, situation. And so everyone, I encourage you all as like Keith has been doing, like throw some information in the chat, um, right? We're all here to professionally grow uh, in the space. So thank you. And Shannon, you can stop sharing your screen and I'm gonna put the nice 10 minute timer up and then everyone can have a quick drink and coffee break. And then our next speaker will be Darren. Um, and we're gonna be starting at 1115. Yeah, also, um, I just realized what I did wrong. Um, there's this one component, instead of actually like copying it and pasting it, um, you would just pull it from your asset panel. Um, I think what happened was that when when you like duplicate it, um, it was actually creating the component itself and not, you're not actually creating a local, you're not actually pulling it out to actually create more of a local component. It's more of a shared component that you were creating. Um, so instead of like duplicating, um, pulling it from assets panels away. Um, I think it just got confusing with some of the names that I had available, but I just want to clarify for people. So instead of like copying yeah. it over, just pull it from the asset panel. Ah, thank you for the clarification. All right, thank you everyone. And I will have a our start our 10 minute break and we'll see you soon. Welcome back everyone. I hope you had a great bio break, had a nice coffee snack you know, enjoyed yourself and like thought through about Shannon's prompts today. Um, so our next speaker is Darren, Darren Hood. Um, and he's all passionate about UX. And so he's gonna give a presentation today. And then um, afterwards, we're gonna have like an open networking session. Uh, Darren, I'm gonna go ahead and give you the co-hosting powers. So give me okay. one second. All right. And I'm gonna stop, uh, stop sharing. All right. Do share do this first. And we'll confirm you can see my screen, okay? Yes, we can. Okay, fantastic. All right, we ready to rock? I am if you are. Okay. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, thanks to those of you in charge. The Brain Trust of World IA Day for for having me. Always excited. I, I usually speak at Kent State. Uh, I, I'm never at home. On the I'm, I always I usually leave. <laughs> so this is a, a new for me and a first for me to be at home. Uh, years ago, I used to come up to U of M for that, but for several years in a row, I was at Kent State. So it was nice for me to to be at home this di uh, this time. So thank you for the opportunity. Uh, glad to hear the great talks already thus far, and I was just going back and forth <laughs> with, uh, with the first speaker, just, just some phenomenal things that I want to share on my podcast. But at any rate, I'm going to stop gushing, and I'm going to get into it here. Uh, so as you know, uh, the introduction is done. I actually even took one of my intro slides out because uh, no sense you hearing more about me right now. Um, but what I will do is uh, just share my a little bit about my professional footprint. I, I do like sharing this. Uh, I have been around for some years now, full-time in UX since 2005, doing it for 10 years prior to that in, 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 in spurts and with a, a, a freelance web design business and part-time on different jobs, things of that nature. But I absolutely love the discipline and, and doing any and everything I can do to, to support it. Currently serving as a UX research manager at Sherwin-Williams. Uh, they just okay remote workers so i will be looking for researchers in the not too distant future hint did he hint hint just so you know but uh at any rate uh my teaching is about to expand a little bit i'm currently teaching at kent state i teach at lawrence tech uh harrisburg university in pennsylvania in talks to to join the staff at ucla 
And uh, later this year, I'll start teaching at Michigan State University in the Masters of CX program over there. So I just wanted to share that for those who might be interested. But diving into the topic, uh, a lot of these things are that you're going to hear. There may be some things that you already know. I, I'm hoping that I can stir up some additional thought with regard to the concept of UA or, or IA. Ah, of IA. I hope I can stir up some additional thoughts on that and and just to help renew people's love for this aspect uh, of UX and to understand the importance of it. Uh, there'll probably be a couple eye-opening moments in here and a, a couple of little provocative things, but that's okay. We just try to, to stir up as much critical thinking as we can. That That's our major goal. So what is IA basically? And I've got three definitions, one from Warman, one from Morville, Rosenfeld, and Arango, and one from usability.gov. And, and I'll read these. Normally don't. I, in this particular case, I think it's important that I do. So first, it's about the creation of systemic, structural, and orderly principles to make something work. I, I love Richard Saul Worman and the way that he, that he words things and the way that he makes us think. Really, really critical. The, the thoughtful making of either artifact or idea or policy that informs because it is clear. Just phenomenal. Just, just love, love the way, again, the way he puts things. Number two from uh, Morville, Rosenfeld, and Arango, they state that it's a design discipline that is focused on making information findable and understandable. These things are key. And then number three from usability.gov, information architecture focuses on organizing, structuring, and labeling content in an effective and sustainable way. The goal is to help users find information and complete tasks. Now, these things might all come across as very obvious, but uh, as you're going to see in throughout this talk, and part of, part of the reason that the talk is, is titled the way it is, Long Live Information Architecture, is that as important as it sounds in hearing these definitions, it actually has taken a back seat in the discipline today, and that's part of what I want to call out. So when we think about the benefits of IA, because, of course, you got your definitions. Now, what, what's in it for us? What's the whiffing factor here? It creates systemic, structural, and orderly principles to help things to work. It makes information findable and understandable, just extracting from the, from the definitions. Organizes structures and labels content in an effective and sustainable way so that people can find information, complete tasks, and make decisions. So to add a little bit more on there. So this is the benefit. Now, the funny thing is, and I'm sort of getting ahead of myself a little bit, but I'm going to say this here as I think it's important to, to help give a little bit more context to what I'm about to present is that over the years, even though these are the benefits of IA, you at one time, the vast majority of us who've been in the discipline for longer than just the last three or four years, we were either information architects or we were interaction designers. The vast majority of us were information architects and information architecture was at the core of what we were learning. And it was at the core of what we did in the last few years. Not so much, not so much. I'll, I'll point that out as we, as we go through this. I thought it'd be important, and I'm so glad I found an English version of this because I had a Spanish version of it before and it was really painful to, to go through it, but uh, glad to have the English here. Just a little bit of history, and I'm gonna do a couple of historical things here. You, you wouldn't think of it, but information architecture was first discussed going all the way back to 1970 all the way back to 1970 at an event with Xerox and the Park Scientific Group, okay, it came up. Six years later, Richard Saul Worman presents it during a lecture in 1976, he talks about it. Okay, so it's out there. Is, does it have a lot of traction? Uh, no, not really, not really. You have to come all the way to uh, the huge milestone to me, which is, Richard Saul Worman wrote a book in 1996. There were a couple other books that were presented. Not, don't have necessarily have the same visibility uh, as his, but when Rosenfeld and Morville wrote their first edition of the Polar Bear book in 1998, 
which is now we have the advent of digital. The internet is a thing and everybody's rushing to the internet. And I'm, I'm sure a lot of you remember the, well, maybe not uh, the dot-com bust. Um, I like to think that it was the dedication to and the embracing of information architecture to help us overcome that because everybody rushed to the internet. But people couldn't find anything. They couldn't complete tasks back to those definitions again. And so, again, you have the book that Roosevelt Morville wrote, the polar bear book. Jacob Nielsen wrote a book around that time. Khan and Lank wrote a book about that time. And now we're having a, actually having a job. Most of us fell into to what we now know as UX, ironically, which I think is absolutely hilarious. You, you can hear 10 or 15, 20, 30, 50 testimonies of early practitioners and the vast majority of us, over 90% of us fell into it. And, and so things start to become apparent. They start to become important. They start to become recognizable. People start to get information architecture on their radar and, and it starts to have some importance. Early schools of thought, again, Richard Stahl Werman, in short, he talked about it as a design of information, what actually informs people. Rosenfeld and, and Morfield sort of uh, kicked off the, the high, I, I want to call it the, the popularity uh, amongst those of us who were in these circles. They really kicked it off for a lot of people, and that book is still referred to today. They still use that as the textbook for the information architecture course at, at Kent State University. So you've got schools of thought ranging from 76 to 98 all foundational when you really think about it, some more recognizable, more popular than others, but that's our foundation. So I want to give you my take on history and, and why what I'm going to talk about today how, really help you to understand different aspects of how and how critical they are. Now, I, I talk about this little, what I call a history lesson, very high level, but I'm only going to point out certain aspects of this. Now, Don Norman is here because he was the first person that we know of who had the, the phrase user experience in his job title when he was doing UX work for Apple. It didn't become popular for another decade or so after that, actually more than a decade, more like 12 years after that, when it started to become commonplace very slowly. But he's the one that sort of kicked it off. We like to think of it that way. So I, I keep that in here. Um, initially, the most of the things we now know as UX work, and I'm just going to say UX, except for where I need, need to specify IA going forward, just for brevity's sake, a lot of the initial work was done, the vast majority of it was done in creative agencies or by creative agencies for corporations. The corporations were being sold on it, but they, they didn't know and they weren't really buying in and they just trusted the agencies, hence the logos at the bottom with Digitas. And, and GS and P and, and different companies like that. Now, once that, some of you are, I'm sure are familiar with the research that was done. IBM did some research and NASA did some research about the importance of user-centered design and the impact it has from an ROI perspective. And there were two different sets of results and other people have done studies uh, after that, but it was those first initial studies that came up that were really huge because Combining the two, for every dollar you invest in UX, you get anywhere from $100 to $250 in return. Well, that's why I have the logos at the top, the corporations, because that's when they decided the light bulbs went on. All they heard was profit. And so they get involved and they start to invest more with the creative agencies. And some of them started to establish UX teams in-house. They're going after that ROI that they heard about. Now, did they learn about UX? No, they just decorated their halls, as some of us like to say, with UX people, but it still opened the door. And so this little illustration at the bottom is just reflective of the, a lot of the interviewing and, and a lot of the, these, this massive drive and of posi open positions available across the employment landscape. But that's also why I have that little toxicity that little nuclear <laughs> icon there, because this is this is where the problem comes in. Now, IA used to dominate in UX spaces. When 
you have the issue where you have more open positions than qualified people to fill them, that's when the issues started to happen. And so I'm going to go beyond this now because we, we don't need to look at that anymore. And I want to illustrate it this way. So again, interaction design was, you see books about interaction design before you see books about information architecture that were written. So back in 96, not a lot of emphasis on IA, a little bit in the books, but not much. And it certainly wasn't called IA. The, the big milestone for us is 1998, as mentioned, when a few books come out, the focus is on IA. I actually like to think that because of Amazon's initial commitment to IA and to user experience, that's one of the reasons why they're so dominant today. The focus on, on what we now know is, is UX, on CX, things of that nature, they're dominant. And, and they made sure that, that they nailed those things and invested properly. And now the ROI speaks for itself. But that was the huge, that was the heyday of IA starting in 98. Now, over time, 2005 to 2007, you start to see the rise of the unicorn. The, the, the corporations want to bring UX people in-house, but they don't want to bring in people for, for with all these little specializations. They don't want to have a person that's doing code and a person that's over here doing this and a person that's over there doing that. And so you start to see the rise of the unicorn in about 2005 to 2007. Are they still looking for them today? Yeah, but that's when it, the drive really started. And to a great extent, a lot of us did, to, we, were, we were information architects that grew to being UX designers and UX architects, and we did everything. The UX architect and the UX designer, we did research, we did information architecture, we did interaction design, we did everything. So pretty, pretty uh, uh, interesting how all that started to, to pan out. Fast forward to 2013, and notice, if you will, IA is getting smaller <laughs> in this illustration. <laughs> uh, then you have the rise of design thinking. And the rise of, which I'm not going to get into in detail, we're just going to focus on IA today. Some of you know how I am, and I'm, I'm going to leave my soapbox over here and stick focus here. Design thinking starts to rise, less focus on IA. In 2019 to 2022, we see the common phrase, everybody's a UXer, everybody's a designer, and focus on IA reduces even more. So I, I think it's, you, I'm hoping you're starting to see the dilemma at hand here is that IA had its heyday, and then over time, it just continues, the focus continues to, to reduce. And, and that is uh, an issue that is still uh, bogging us down a bit today. There's an educational side that I would like everybody to consider. Now, back in the mid-90s, again, we fell into UX, many of us. You surely didn't find a program that would allow you to study a lot of the things that we now know today as UX. But in 2000, degree programs did start to, to be established at, at different universities. I'm really happy about that. That's a good thing. We need formal education around anything that needs to be a point of expertise, no matter what the discipline is. In 2011, and remember what was going on before, and I'll, I'll sort of bring a lot of this together in a moment, the boot camps get established. Uh, in particular, there were already uh, developer boot camps, but UX boot camps came on the scene in about 2011. These are for-profit learning centers. I remember one when I went to the Wayback Machine just to study their marketing. I noticed that they start, you see them start to advertise UX courses in 2011, but they were focusing on lean UX. There was no, no focus on, not, and not only then in 2011, but even today, there is no focus in the boot camps on UX. And I've got a, a quote from a person that you may find interesting here in a moment, that it's one person's quote, but I've talked to countless individuals who all had the same, the same testimony. The MOOCs came along, massive open online courses, your edX, your Udemy, uh, Coursera, places like that. People could learn about UX, but there is, there is not a consistent presentation of or emphasis on information architecture. So that, again, it parallels how you see the reduced focus on the discipline. 2018, micro degrees becoming more common. And again, you can learn about UX, 
but you don't see the emphasis on IA that's reflective of what we need in today's design culture. Now, just to help illustrate what's going on from a boot camp perspective today, and this is a direct quote that came from someone. And again, I talked to many people who feel the same exact way. They felt that, that their, their experience was exactly the same as this individual, but they said that regarding information architecture, some material on the subject was presented, but there was very little explanation or theory and no practice was offered. So it was, IA is being presented in many educational experiences as an aside. When you consider the fact that IA is at the core of what we do and who we are, this, this absence of, of emphasis on UX is eventually, or did eventually become directly connected with the lack of emphasis on UX in the U or, or IA in the user experiences. And when you consider the benefits, when you consider the benefits of IA, isn't that a problem? Now look at this. This is where I look to combine these things. And these are, these are estimates. 1995, little to no, there's gotta be some, we would assume some, some focus on, on what we know as information architecture. We just started calling things certain things after a certain time as well. So we want to keep that in mind. I estimate 3%, 60% in 98, 90% in 2003. That's the peak. But it has continued to decrease to today in 2022. We're talking about approximately 13%. It, it is, I, I've worked a lot of places. I talk to people all over the world. I speak all over the world. I have my podcast, I talk to my guests, I talk to people, I mentor people, and, and the topic of IA frequently comes up because I'm asking about it, and I inquire with a lot of people, and they either don't know, don't think about it, or there's no emphasis, and so that leads to where we are today, like, what, what is going on? IA, again, is at the core of who we are. When you think about the major, what I like to co constantly refer to the mate of as the major product. What does IA produce? It produces findability. That is the main thing, the main product that comes out of information architecture. And if that's the case, isn't that at the core of every single solitary user experience? I, I'm reminded of, and I don't have a slide in here to address this, but I think it's good to mention it here. Many of you are familiar with vitamin T. Vitamin T did some research in, I believe it was about 2017, 2018, that, that the results were shared. And they said that 97% of websites, the experiences were actually not optimal. I, I paraphrase. 97%. That's the part that stands out to me. 97% of, of experiences are not optimal, but it's because of that same degraded experience that I alluded to and the fact that IA is not being taught, it's not being learned, there's no focus on it. There have been some books that have been published lately on information architecture, but not very many. I have a book list up on Medium. I share it regularly and people get excited when they find out about it. And it's like their first foray into information architecture. And that's why I, I, I constantly share the information I'm sharing with you today because we have to turn back to information architecture. The, the, the long live information architecture is not just a cute phrase or it's not a cute phrase at all. We need to make sure that we're putting the proper emphasis on it. We need to make sure that we're sharpening our saw concerning it. If we're educators, we, we need to make sure that we're stressing the importance of information architecture because again, its product is findability and it's directly connected to the finding of information and the completion of tasks. And that's what everybody is doing. That's at the core of every mental model that we, that we look at. And so we should not be leaving information architecture aside. I want to point out 10 key IA factors, and we're going to shift over to our, our tapping, tapping into the, the theme for this year's World IA Day. Uh, 10 key IA factors I want to just call out. There's some here that are, I mean, it's not limited to 10 is what I'm trying to say here now. 
there are more than 10 key factors. These are just 10 that I choose to highlight, highlight today, but some of these are definitely key and the most important, such as nomenclature. What is nomenclature? It's the way things are labeled. How, how are you labeling things in your navigation? What, how are your calls to action structured? And a lot of this work today is being passed on to what folks are calling UX writers, but we did all of these things years ago as information architects. So nomenclature is key. Taxonomies, how are you grouping things? Nomenclature plus taxonomy e equals what's referred to as an information set. I, I, I read part of a book years ago called Information Foraging Theory, where the author stated that people hunt for information in a way that is highly reflective and reminiscent of the way that animals hunt for food. Hence the name of the book, Information Foraging Theory. So when people are looking for information, when they're trying to find info, when they're trying to complete tasks, we are looking for a scent the same way that a bear or a fox or, or whatever the animal is, is trying to find food. And so the nomenclature plus the taxonomy, you know when you nailed it, because then people get the proper information sent and then they can find what it is that they're looking for. These information, well, this information, the nomenclature and the taxonomies usually make up number four. The navigation, that's usually where you find it. There's some other elements, and I'll talk about those in a moment. And so all of these come together as part of key aspects of information architecture. Number five is findability. This, again, is the major product. This is what a strong information architecture or what a, any information architecture should produce, even a bad one. Uh, will produce it or produ produce a non-findability. If people can't find what they're looking for, you have an IA problem. Uh, so findability is key. Facilitating the ease by which info and tasks are found and completed within an experience. Search. Some people don't think that search is a part of information architecture, but it is. The search appliance that's used is key. Every search experience has an appliance. How are you actually supporting the, the search experience. How are you searching how results are displayed? If you have suggestive search as part of it, what's the database that's tied into that suggestive search? I remember doing a search years ago on a website and, and, and I love typos because we get a lot of free uh, entertainment <laughs> out of typos. And one day I, I type, I was trying to type something and, it, and I typed Sly, S-L-Y on the Delta Fawcett site. They fixed this, this is years ago. I typed in SLY, and when I typed in SLY, the suggestive search said Sylvester Stallone. And I'm thinking, why is that a suggestion? And so, of course, curiosity is at the core of what we do as well. So, of course, I clicked on it. I click on it thinking that apparently, are you mean to tell me there's a Sylvester Stallone Delta Fawcett special edition? So I click on it. And then it says the, the results, it, 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 it brought back the null results. Why did you suggest something that's not here? Why did you suggest something that's not relevant? Uh, so the, again, it has to do with findability. If anything that's associated with findability is a part of information architecture. So for those that may not be, have been aware, search is a part of that. I like to separate number seven from number six because filtering and faceting are a part of the search experience. People should be able to take the results that come back, especially if they're a lot, and then filter them or break them down in a way that makes them more useful. So the way that we present and uh, filtering and fastening and having that, that functionality available is critical to the IA. Inline links. Uh, some people don't see inline links as a part of information architecture, but they are. Uh, if you if you can provide easier ways for people to find what they're looking for, then do it. Inline links, not click here. Make it an inline link so people can the link the link is obvious. People can click it. They can go find what they're looking for, and everybody's good to go. So inline links are part of that. Content strategy. I know this is a separate discipline, but every time I look at content strategy, I see it as a part of IA. I see it as IA's cousin, if you will, and these are, this is basically revolving around the efforts to manage and optimize the information presented on a site to ensure its value, consistency, and relevance. This is a huge undertaking that we need to make sure that we're paying strict attention to, 
And again, you have people who are content strategists, strategists by trade. That's what they focus on. That's all fine and dandy. But we need to make sure that we that we provide that information and that 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 uh, um, functionality on our teams. Somebody has to look at the, the content. Somebody has to make sure that deprecated content is is accounted for. Then there's research impact. So that could be tree testing, card sorting. So these are 10 key IA factors. We want to make sure that we have these, that we're focusing on them. We have these on our radar. We're focusing on them, that everything is, is being taken care of properly. So tapping into, for the last few minutes here, IA in the connected world. This is the theme for this year's event. According to the folks that were on IA Day, in a world where we're connected yet distanced, how do we facilitate connectedness? Information architecture is at the core of this. Remember, the product of information architecture is findability. And I love what Peter Morville said in ambient findability. He said, where the internet meets ubiquitous computing, the histories of navigation, communication, commerce, and information seeking converge. So this is key. He also says, uh, speaking of some goals, we want to find our way. We want to find products. We want to find answers. And we want to find ourselves. He goes on to say, once again, findability serves as a useful lens for seeing where we've been and what lies ahead. These are things that are at the core of why a connected world is important. And we have absolutely no shortage of connectivity options whatsoever. <laughs> There's no shortage. You can connect the people across all these different venues. However, I do encourage you, Please do not leave off critical thinking. All information is not val valuable. Misinformation abounds. So these things are critical. Make sure that, that you embrace critical thinking in the midst of it. So nomenclature, taxonomies, information sets, these things are at the key of what we do. These are the major aspects of IA. Let's make sure we embrace it today. Don't allow the, the, the backsliding, if you will, in UX concerning IA to overtake you. Rediscover it if you have to. Discover it if you don't know about it, because uh, it's a beautiful thing, and it's going to help take the discipline forward. The more we embrace IA, the more it takes us forward. Even this old classic illustrations, I know some of you are probably familiar with this. I never noticed the bottom right-hand portion. Information architecture, it connects people to the content they're looking for, but it also connects us to conversations and other people. So connectivity is dependent upon information architecture. So folks, that is it. And I'm ready to take any questions before we get there. Actually, you want to find me, find me in my podcast. I'm on Twitter. LinkedIn is where most folks choose to chat with me. Uh, I, have, I have my UX Uncensored channel on YouTube. We have the UX Chit Chat Hour where we meet with people once a month to talk about UX uh, I'm every on medium. I'm everywhere. So anyway, that's it. I knew I had to wrap up running short. Oh, no, you're good. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. That was a great, uh, a great presentation. Um, and yeah, we, we were trying to get our links ready for everyone. Uh, and yeah, we saw we were, we were quite visible in the internet space. <laughs> um, so, uh, some people were just wondering, like, um, we just want to clarify and you can just like do a quick summarization of like, why you think I has degraded over time. If you were to do like a one liner or two. Sure. Um, just from all the people that I speak with, different places that I've worked, things that people, the, the knowledge and skill levels that people say that they have, areas where they say that they need to grow, evaluation of different education programs across the country, no matter what that education program is, there's a dearth of IA. The knowledge of it, the focus on it, understanding of it, including it in curriculums, it's, it's pedagogically absent <laughs> in a lot of places. <laughs> and, 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 and that's a problem because that's at the core of what we do as stated. So if people are not learning it, they're certainly not going to, I mean, you're going to do some of it because it'll happen out of common sense, but the, the expertise and the fostering of that expertise is not where it should be. I'm laboring to change that. And I think we need to make sure that we do that across the board. Some, some universities do it. Some programs do it. Uh, some don't. They just right, touch right. on it. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Did we do it? Yes, check mark. We're good. Yeah. Um, 
Thank you for that input. Um, I, I totally relate to that. Like I said, I'm someone not from this background. And so I had to actively take a course in it or I had to actively join a club or a professional community to be like, okay, so how do you guys do this? Because no one is teaching me this. And I understand that this is right common sense. I, I came up to me at work and I don't know how to solve it. Um, so thank you for that. Um, um, Elizabeth commented, that's one of the reasons why I came to you, Mish. It was one of the few program, programs that actually offers information architecture. Um, yep. So thank you, Elizabeth. Um, uh, Jeff has a question. Do you think IA has perhaps shifted to other areas like knowledge management and digital creation? Good question, Jeff. I'd, I'd say no. Um, knowledge management is, is it's like uh, content strategy. It's an aspect of content strategy. It is, I see knowledge management was actually part of the, that's the way the program used to be structured at Kent State. It was information architecture and knowledge management. So you actually learned it all together. So I, I, in my, I was already practicing when I went to Kent, but it did because of the way they presented it, it caused me to sort of group them together to not really view one apart from the other at all and to make sure to have my eye on one while looking at the other. Information architecture was the was the key, it was the crux, and then knowledge management was this next phase that you would all always engage in. So, so you can't do one without the other. And, and as far, and what was the second part again? Uh, digital cre creation. Digital creation? Curation. Creation. Curation. Yeah. I need I need <laughs> to you. expound on that. What what's meant by that before yeah, I Jeff. answer? Yeah, at and least I at least here at you, Mish, like digital curation is now one of the tracks, at least in the MSI program. Um okay. th there is like a, a UX research and design track, and there's uh now a digital curation track. So which focuses much more on um the like taxonomy side of, of UX and understanding uh, metadata and uh, yeah, mostly um, curating like digital systems and yeah, looking from that frame. Okay, okay. I always understood that as part of, of IA. That's the way I've always understood it. You, it there where emphasis might be greater or less depending upon the initiative, depending upon their project. But taxonomy is always a part. I, I have an illustration. Some of you may have seen it before. I took it out of this deck. Um, it was I've delivered this talk before, and it was a part of it. And taxonomy, I have grouped under information architecture as a part of that discipline. So again, I mean, back in 2003, if you created a website, remember, it's about findability. And SEO was all the rage. And you had to make sure that all of your metadata was optimized so that you could optimize findability. So you couldn't roll out a website. Even, even back in my team Detroit days, well, Global Team Blue now, but back in my team Detroit days, we would constantly, on a monthly basis, a, a, a monthly basis, we would study different uh, artifacts and resources that people were downloading off the site and metadata was a huge part of that. So if you didn't understand the metadata, you couldn't really participate in those conversations or, or optimize the user experience. So yeah, I always saw it as a part of IA. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah, you. it's just interesting because in like the UX courses, uh, a lot of uh, these approaches like taxonomy and learning metadata isn't covered really at all. Um, so yep. yeah, unless students take like these other courses um, that might be more in like the traditional library science considered courses mm -hmm. that are, yeah, are now yep. more like digital archives and digital curation. Um, that's yeah, that's, that taxonomy is <laughs> not covered at all. And, and it's, it's funny you mentioned that because IA or, well, just UX in general. It, it's, I got into UX through instructional design. And a lot of the things that we did in that discipline, I found were applicable and that we were doing them over here uh, on this side. Uh, a lot of things that we do in UX coming through IA, which, which was the predecessor discipline, really, when, when you think about it, was actually built on the back of library science. And that's where that, that, that connection is really strong. So we have to have those taxonomies in place. I mean, you go to a library, you're trying to find a book, 
and you start going out around the library, whether we realize it or not, looking for information sets, going through the little Dewey decimal with the little card catalog system. That's what we were doing. We're doing the same exact thing. We're just doing it digitally today. So those, those aspects of the discipline are critical for us to always fall back on. And why I always tell people, don't ignore the initial parts of the discipline. Has you actually evolved? Yes and no. Uh, there, there, it, we should be doing things that were done in the earlier days of the discipline are still valuable today. And, and the people who embrace those will be stronger in their function as UX professionals. The, you don't want people to drink the Kool-Aid of, of things that are happening today as if things that we did yesterday don't have value there. They're extremely valuable. They're extremely powerful. And they allow you to be no, more definitive when you're interacting with clients and, and uh, stakeholders as well, too as opposed to some of these guessing games and what I personally refer to as glorified spitballing sessions that are, that are passed off as something else. It, it's really critical and important. Thank you, Darren. Um, just to, let's see, I think we can answer like one more question. So um, well, this is a, brought up another good question of like, how do you think methodologies like lean, agile, waterfall, et cetera, have contributed to the integration of IA into UX practice? Um, I don't, for me, in my, in my observation, it hasn't really changed uh, whether we're, the only difference to me, and, I, and I'll, to answer the question, I'll focus on, I, on um, Waterfall versus Agile. When we worked in Waterfall, we, you just did your work, right? To me, the only difference is what I've done to simplify doing work in, in Agile, because most of us are in Agile environments now. Um, what I found is I just commit to work per sprint. That's the only change I made. <laughs> Talk about simplifying it. So I, I commit, I'm going to do these six things during the sprint. I know I can accomplish these six things. If for whatever reason, something comes up that, that we didn't see, then we may modify it. We, we may have to roll something over to the next sprint. We have to put something on the backlog. But basically, I'm still doing the same exact things that I did. I might do them faster. Um, I might be given to more iteration, but it hasn't changed the work for me at all. And, and I try to convey that as much as I can, because a lot of people are confused, especially about doing UX and agile. It's just, they just took the, the, the long-term goal and they just pared it down and chopped it up into little pieces. So you chop up your, your deliverable dates and your initiatives into pieces as well. And it's worked for me. That's all I did. Thank you. All right. So now we're hitting the noon hour, which is leading into our open networking session. Is it okay if I take up the screen, uh, Darren? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Let me go back to the presentation. All right. I have too many tabs open. All right. <laughs> So just so everyone knows, oh, I have something to post in the Discord channel. Um, so World IA Information or World IA Day is 365 day, you know, days a year. And if you want to continue these conversations, um, there is a Discord group, um, which is I thought really interesting. A lot of organizations have been moving in that kind of direction. And so if you're, you know, an organizer or your practitioner or you're just for someone who's interested in, you know, IA, um, I recommend a Discord group. Um, also, we have gifts. So the World uh, IA uh, Association, um, they are offering gifts, like goodie bags for everyone, for all attendees. Um, and there is a global lottery going on. And so the end, the end date for this is on the March 15th. So if you guys can do it, I'm gonna leave this screen open for about 30 seconds as you grab your phones and take some pictures. Um, and can someone please put the link in the chat as well um, in case someone doesn't have their phone nearby. Uh, so you can see that we get 20% discount code off the Rosenfeld Media Store purchase, $25 off any of their conferences, um, as well as $5 off their IAC conference registration. And then Rosenfeld is offering um, one full digital library set of their eBooks, um, as well as Optimal Workshop is offering a six month uh, subscription to their workshops. And, a, and there's a chance of a pair of uh, some Boyd's noise canceling headphones. So again, the contest ends on March 15th at around, it looks like midnight. Um, in the UT time zone. Um, and the winners will be contacted directly. So just so you know, this is not sponsored by the Ann Arbor WIAD. Um, it's sponsored by, like I said, the Global uh, World Information Architecture Association. All right, I'm gonna be moving forward. 
So you guys have brought on really great conversations and they've brought in different resources and links. And so I want to put these links here for you guys um, as we're going to be giving you the slide deck at the end um, of today's presentation, as well, it's going to be sent in your email. So we did put down Darren Hood's uh, UX podcast. I thought that was really helpful. And he did mention that he, um, as we're going to go back, You'll see if you look at each presenter's slide, I included some of their web pages, um, maybe their personalized portfolio, as well as I did put Darren's um, uh, overall web space. And then I put Daniel's and Shannon's portfolio in here, the thing that we talked about, which is object-oriented UX, the magic of UX by Daniel Rosenberg. Um, questions of like, what are affordances? Um, I know we mentioned before, like there was a UX uh, uh, at UMICH conference coming up if you're interested, as well as the mailing list for the UXBA. And another one that we had a big question of like, what is the definition of IA? Um, so I wanna thank you all for coming and you could stay after this presentation if you wanna ask Darren or Shannon some more questions. I'm not sure if Daniel's still here, um, but if, if he is and he's still available, you can ask him questions too. Um, otherwise, it's gonna be like a small networking session. Again, drop your LinkedIn down in the chat. Um, otherwise, have a great you know rest of your weekend and thank you all for coming. And I hope to see you next year for YAD 2023 and hopefully in person. Thank you everyone.